So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott and Dot to talk with you about what's going on in the schools. And if you want to have other conversations, take, please take them outside so we can hear them. So Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gus. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Scott Thompson. Dorothy Naylor is here. And as of the end of today, the district school board, which is at present composed of 10 people, will expand to 15 people. And Kari Bradley is on the ballot for Callis. So um, this is what is happening. For the moment, though, all you have is, um, is Dorothy and myself. Um, the reason why we're here for the next few minutes is not just as a, as a warm-up act for town meeting, but um, also to provide you an opportunity to, um, to take pot shots, throw darts, ask questions, and if perhaps there's a bouquet to hurl, we'll take that too. Um, but the, the main thing is there's so much change going on in the way we've been governing our school system. Um, it, it's hard, even for us who are in the thick of it, to know where to start in order to explain what's going on and, and to kind of give you a sense, a, 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 enough of a feel so that you have a sense of comfort in, in what's happening. So um, what I'd like to do first is, um, as I often do, um, pass the buck to the indispensable woman on this school board, Dorothy Naylor. Oh, thank you, Scott. Um, before you go on top, before you go on, there's an awful lot of background noise and chatter, so really, if you want to have a conversation, please go outside so that people can hear each other in this discussion. Thank you. It, it's been such a very busy year trying to have our school board begin to know each other and work together, although many of us have worked with each other over the last few years in various other boards. But my focus when I'm in this position, besides all the important things of making sure we have a good education, is I really want to make sure we get the communities involved more than they are, maybe more than they have been, and um, I am really pushing for the little towns to have their own quasi school committees where the town would have to decide, or you people would have to decide, I don't know if the town as a, as, as a body has to decide, but we need to decide who we want on it other than the principal and our maintenance people to meet on a regular basis and really know what's going on in our little school and be able to bring that to the board and to get the board to listen. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to have us have a, us being Washington Central Unified Unity, <laughs> which I hope we can change someday. Um, we need to have um, our own article of agreement at how you form the committee. I think each town should decide how to form the committee, what they want them to do, um, and that's something that I'm pushed, pushing. If you read Front Porch Forum, you'll see I have made an effort to write a very neutral list of what's been going on at the meeting, so you at least know what's been going on, and you should be able to usually get the agendas be for what's happening the next time, at least the topics. And um, we really want to have some more people come from time to time to our meetings, just as, well, I was going to say, you better wait a few weeks or months, because now we have 15 and we have to figure out the seating, if nothing else. <laughs> so that I can hear, because I'm the deaf one, and even with hearing aids, I miss a lot, and I know it. Um, so that's kind of my focus, is getting the communities more involved. And we'll need some of you 
to be willing to come. And I'm not seeing this as a school committee that meets every week, maybe not even once a month, but um, a several at the beginning of the year, in the middle, and so forth. But some some citizens who can keep of their fingers on the school and let us know what the school needs, rather than having to go through another kind of chain of command. I, I want the locals to still have some kind of say. And um, that's kind of my push, besides trying to be um, a, a calm person at the board. Your turn. <laughs> oh, I didn't say Thank you, Dorothy. Um, yes. Have you all received this, or have, do you know what this is? Um, this is the annual report of the merged school district, the Unified Union School District. There are a whole bunch of them somewhere. They are right outside this door. They're right outside the door where you come in the room, um, inside the gym door. There's a whole pile of them, and they, well, they're kind of like, but not, what you used to get that had all the information about U32 in your school. And um, I have asked for the next issue to be in newsprint. I think this is an expensive piece that has not enough information in it. Um, there, there, uh, there is a sort of a, almost like a corporate annual report vibe to it, which, um, I mean, in a sense, that's kind of what we've become. Um, we've gone, this, this school at uh, Cowles Elementary, our annual budget was in the neighborhood of $2 million per year. Now it's part of an entity that has a budget of $35 million per year, which is what you're voting on today, which is roughly um, the size of the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So that's the, that's the scale that we're on right now. Um, one more question. Do, um, do you all know that we have a new superintendent hired beginning July 1st? Um, I'm seeing nodding, but also shaking of heads. So um, for those of you who haven't heard, we have hired uh, a superintendent named Brian Olkowski who um, will be coming to us from, from Connecticut via New Jersey, um, who's sort of a, a specialist in, um, in difficult situations, but who has an amazing, um, has some amazing qualities, including a uh, 50,000 watt personality. So um, that, that is just the most superficial description. He also comes with a, um, with a great skill set that I think he'll have an opportunity to use with us and help us go where we want to go. Since the, the problem with becoming a bureaucracy is that the nature of, of that mindset doesn't always fit so well with the nature of education. Um, bureaucracy being best for routine type things, education being best for just the opposite. Um, so, uh, are there, are there questions? Are there concerns? Rick? Um. that you're seeing that are kind of impediments to doing this job well 
And I'm, as you know, I participate in a lot of meetings, and I, I'm observing this myself. You know, there's an overwhelming amount of information there, and some of it just talk, honestly, some of it isn't. But are you seeing are you big problems that we have to overcome because of this kind of consolidation, this forcing upward and away from the community, you know, the decision making that's going on? Well, I'm kind of going to address how we operate in the meetings because they're so long. Luckily, we have ORCA to look back at our meetings. They're all taped. And uh, many people have complained that our meetings are so long, and I have suggested that our members go back and look at the tapes. Just notice not how many times they speak, but how many times they repeat themselves and are really ready to give their idea, and this takes a lot of time. We need to have members who are more economical with their thoughts and not repeat it, and that should shorten the meeting somewhat. I don't mean people should not talk. We need their ideas, um, and I have to admit there are many times that I, ideas have come forward that I have never thought of and am willing to contemplate and sometimes change my mind. So, but that's one of the problems with the length of, of it. And I, I'm hoping we don't have to make any so-called rules for ourselves um, to shut people up. From my perspective, the hardest part is the sense that my knowledge is, or what I have to know is much broader, but it's also much shallower. So I feel as though um, there's a lot more to do, um, but with less knowledge about that. Um, and, and that's um, what we're hoping, just as Dorothy was talking about earlier, the, um, the school uh, advisory councils or committees or whatever, whatever the name those entities eventually come up with, that will help to develop um, school-based expertise that I think the board is desperately in need of. Another, another issue that is um, percolating underneath, in, in fact, now that the, you know, the, the pro-merger and anti-merger bumper stickers have been torn off you know, the, um, the community, I, there is a deeper difference that, that I find very interesting. I, I don't want to get too theoretical, but Basically, it's the difference between a conception of the school board as a kind of quasi-private sector corporate board, like a non-profit board or something, versus the idea of a school board as a kind of a, more of a governmental body um, that, um, that responds to the people. You see this in, um, if you've been following the news, there are situations even close by in um, Harwood, uh, next door to us, as well as out in Addison, where school boards are um, essentially rejecting um, petitions that people have brought forward, uh, that where there are mock school boards, um, school board meetings being set up by citizens to protest you know, the, what they feel is their school board's alienation in, um, from, from the people. I, for, uh, we only mark ourselves, <laughs> fortunately, so far. But um, this, is a, this is a kind of divide, um, intellectual divide, I guess, that, that will need to be bridged, that will need to kind of figure out a, um, a proper you know, combination of synthesis. Can I just agree with him quickly? I, I yeah, part of the thing about being community, wanting the community to be more involved is I want our board to be more agile and respond to uh, the community more quickly than a you know, will study that and get back to you next year. I do not like that. We need to change that. No, I'm, I'm going to build on uh, something you said, Scott. That is, you know, the bureaucracy versus uh, 
staying current or even projecting into the future. Uh, what I see, and I'm wondering, you know, what are the creative solutions to it? Uh, dealing with the zombie-like status quo thinking and behavior of the education bureaucracy that is stuck in a paradigm. But not cat. Huh? Not cat. <laughs> okay. No, not about individual people. It's not good or bad. It's just stuck there. But I've been working with the education system for 30 years. Well, business. Uh, managers, principals, superintendents, from early education all the way through working with presidents of colleges. And what I have seen is that they're stuck in a paradigm uh, that increasingly uh, uh, is not meeting our needs of our society or of our country or of the world. Um, and it seems like this Centralization is just solidifying that bureaucracy of status quo thinking in the education world. Do you have any ideas? I mean, I like the idea of local committees and so on, on how we can not get caught in a corporate uh, bureaucracy, but be leaders on the future and challenging the bureaucracy in a nice way. I don't have an answer to that at this point. I, I, I feel the same way. I feel the Agency of Education and to some extent the State Board of Education are, are applying to little tiny Vermont and the tiny, tiny towns the ideas of way bigger communities. And, and we just know that doesn't fit. Um, when many of us don't have cell service, um, you can't get an electrician to come and fix something anymore. I mean, I, we're talking about, also been talking about how many kids go to four-year colleges. I'm not so sure that's a good number to be looking at. It's really expensive. I'd rather see the same number of kids go into a two-year college and then springing into the four-year college because community colleges are much less expensive. They can get a good education for two years and then spend some money if they need to. I, being an excellent plumber and an excellent electrician and, and those people, they do good work and we need them and they don't, they have pretty good incomes, I think. I mean, they're not millionaires, yeah, but not, neither are the rest of us. So uh, that's some of the things I'm, I'm wanting to push, but just one little lone voice. Somebody will go along someday. <laughs> I, I don't think you're a lone voice. Um, I, Jack, I, that's a great question, um, and I will, I will follow up with you personally. Hi, I'm Adrian, um, and I work at U32, and I just wanted to comment that, well, I have a lot of things to say. I'm trying to keep it short, so thank you for all of your work. I know that this job has been really huge and way too much work for you, so I appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, the other thing that I had to say, I, I, I appreciate the like fear of the corporate, and, and I totally understand the bureaucracy piece of it. I also just wanted to, to put a, a little you know, comment about how U32 has been doing this for a long time, because we are all five districts, all, all five schools in one. So if I'm following correctly, I think that what could be helpful is um, working towards U32 a little bit more and, and asking maybe for help from U32 and U32 working on our way to bring towns together because that's already something that's implemented. Like all of those kids are in one building now. And that's not a solution for Callis and Berlin and no sex, but if they have a goal to go to U32 together, there is that building that's bringing them together. And that's something that we need to work on is relationships and like building that like um, more solid community and less separate. I just wanted to point out that 
Like for people who are worried, this is something that's already in place and it has been in place for years. Everybody's been going to 32 for years. And while some things aren't working, there are a lot of things that do work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, I think U32 is a great example of, of towns working together. Um, there's the, the main change is, is, is sort of deeper than that, um, and kind of cultural, and fighting the, um, you know, the kind of negative headwinds um, that might otherwise tend to diminish the, um, the quality of the edu educational experience overall. Is, um, but, but thank you. That, I think that, that's an important point to make, that U32 works. And, and there's no reason why this can't work. I mean, it's a fact, and we have to deal with that fact. And, um, and that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to do in the best way we can. has the lead on that. I think we're, um, I, I personally am not looking forward to it because the block grant approach is typically, but if you look back, just for example, when the feds converted um, to, uh, to temporary assistance to needy families um, from the previous uh, uh, welfare system and went to block grants, the black grants were set in something like 1996, and they haven't changed since. Black grants tend to be a way for the state, for the funder, to basically back away at the rate of inflation from their support for, um, in this case, special education. So we're, we're still trying to figure out what the implications will be and how, how best to manage them. Yeah, can I do? Could you wait for the microphone? Um, I don't know if I have a lot to add to that. I do know that our director of special education, Kelly Bushy, has um, been working with the folks at the state to really think about where we're going to get next. Um, I think there is still a lot of information to figure out to decide what is the direction for us to take. Um, but I think there's a little ner some nerves, for sure. Oh, I'm Scott Benson, Charlize Gass. Um, Scott, what do people say to you when you ask about the very uncommon level of appraisal that's been applied to all of our tax rates? And what can we do about it to try to make it more common? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Scott. The, uh, you know what he's talking about, right? The common level of appraisal? which is, um, it's in this book, um, and, and it's the adjustment that's applied to our town tax rate based on how close the, um, the tax department reckons our grand list is to the actual market value of our property being taxed. The, um, in principle, the, all five towns are supposed to pay the same the same education tax rate. But that is then, um, even though we're considered an, a, a merged district, the, um, the common level of appraisal is applied separately to each town, which is sort of you know, incoherent if you're thinking, oh, we're supposed to be merged, and yet we're being treated all differently. So um, this is apparently, and I, I saw Janet earlier, but she may have left to visit the other, her other um, towns. Um, this, I think, is a legislative um, issue. The legislature has to, has to act in order to combine so that um, there's a, a common 
common level of appraisal, um, which would also have the advantage because places like Callis or Worcester especially, often um, there, there may be times when property sales are fairly um, rare. So they're making statistical judgments based on a minuscule sample, which is, um, which is not really legitimate. Um, but which has a very real effect on the tax rates that we pay. But we can, uh, I don't know how we do it, but we can change our common level of, of appraisal by, we have to redo something, and I don't re remember, re we have to reappraise somehow, either a, a, a uh, the listeners are shaking their heads no. Um, sometimes they do it by a flat percentage, but um, I was just looking at the differences, and for instance, Berlin and Worcester are two of the towns whose common level of appraisal is at 100%. So they're down, they're, they, what they pay is slightly less, really, than the common $1.79 and some. Callis and East Montpelier are the lowest. Um, we're at 95% and East Montpelier is at 93%. So um, we can, and, and it will be work, we can do better with our common level of appraisal. Okay, Paul, I don't know how long that would take. Paul Hannon's going to get the last comment and then we'll start okay. the town meeting. I, I hope this is Paul Hannon from South Callis. Um, I don't like that. So like, I, I'm not convinced the common level of appraisal really matters all that much. That may sound heretical because you're looking at this and you're paying more. But basically, the reason there's a differential is that the towns are appraising property on a town by town basis. In other words, there isn't one that it would be, we all be at, at the same level if all the towns were appraised by the same entity, but we're not. So, our you know, if your property is worth, you think it's worth, the town thinks it's worth $100,000, but in fact, the comparable properties have sold for one hundred twenty. Well, then we're, our appraisals are below what the market is by a certain amount, and therefore, your tax rate is ratcheted up. But it's still based, your tax rate is still based on what the town says your property is worth at $100,000, so you're not really paying any more. It's just being adjusted to make up for the fact that there's disparate appraisers out there. Yeah, but, um, yes, this is a technical question. Yeah. Sorry. That's fine. That's fine. I'm Candace, and I'm a lister, <laughs> or an assessor. Uh, two things. Um, the uh, state ballot, which is the uh, Vermont Association of Listers and Assessors, are looking at what it would take to do a combined CLA on school districts. It's a little bit difficult. Um, the way each town measures their CLA is based on a three-year rolling sales information between what has been sold and the relationship or ratio between the sales price and the listed assessor price. And it's a three-year rolling those folks that have a 1.00 or a 100%, they just got done with the reappraisal, which is what East Callis had in 2015. Each year, the market goes up a little bit. Our assessment sort of goes up, but it stays the same. So then we get the reduction, and our CLA is at 95. We can't really do anything about it, because we have to measure this by market forces. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Scott and Dorothy, for your good work. And I'll ask the select board to come on up now and we'll get the town meeting started in just a moment. Sure. Or I can use a shoe.
morning. aside for Judy to conduct that election. Good morning. Are there nominations for the moderator for the ensuing year? Denise? Can I nominate Gus Selig? Second. Gus Selig has been nominated for the moderator and it's been seconded. Are there any other nominations for the moderator? Hearing none, all in favor of closing nominations, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All in favor of Gus Selig for moderator, please say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Gus Selig is our moderator for the ensuing year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege to uh, have this job and, and do this once a year. Um, if the history books that Gail Graham has in the back uh, on Callis are correct, this is, I think, our 226th annual uh, uh, town meeting. Um, my role in this meeting is to facilitate your discussion and your debate. Um, and do we have some first time people here today or second time people? Okay, well, welcome. Thank you for participating. Um, there's a couple things going on today, and one is town meeting. Uh, equally important for some of us is lunch. David, do you want to say a word about lunch? Once again, we are hoodwinked you into bringing the food and buying it back. So it is still $5 for lunch, a great deal, incredible cuisine from all over out. Thank you. And the to town hall. So this, this time it's being run by the Friends of the Town Hall. Brand new organization that you can sign up to be a member of at the table in the rear. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay. Yes. I move we adjourn the meeting to lunch. <laughs> Skip that. I'm open to an amendment. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll do that in just a second. Um, so I'm going to, in a moment, ask the select board to introduce themselves. But first, I want to say a few things about how this meeting works. And in addition to town meeting and lunch, the other thing that's going on is a presidential primary. Um, and um, so you can get your ballot at any point up till 7 o'clock tonight to vote if you haven't done so already. Um, we are actually in an area where an election is being conducted. I don't see anybody currently wearing um, any electioneering paraf paraphernalia, and you should not in this space. I won't ask you to take off your shirt if you are wearing such paraphernalia, but um, that's what you're not supposed to do, is, is electioneer with an election going on in this space. Um, a few things about how town meeting works. Um, we work from the, from the warning that's in this book, and there are 18 articles that begin on page 6 um, that guide how we do our business. Um, I've been asked by several people, when can I bring up a subject that might not be clearly warned? 
and the two times would be in the next article, Article 2, to ask questions about the reports of town boards and officers. And you, because you, if you don't see something in there, you can ask why was it not in here. And then the other time would be under other business. The problem with other business is we can't do anything binding that was not warned. Okay, so you may have something you want the select board to do in the coming year. You're going to probably you can make mention of it today. You may get several fellow citizens to agree they really ought to be working on this or that but we can't take binding action that would force them to do that because the voters of the town didn't know it was going to be up for action today and somebody might have wanted to come to participate in that discussion if it had been warned. Um, the, the warning is developed mostly by the select board. Sometimes there are articles that people request that they put them on. When we get to an article, I will ask a proponent of that article to move it and then it's going to be open, open for discussion by all of you. You are acting as the legislature for, for um, the town today. The select board is sitting up front to be accountable to you, uh, not because they may be more knowledgeable on a specific issue, but we're all equal and they only get one vote today, um, just like all the rest of us. Um, if that's true. It's all you ever get. But sometimes you're one of five. Today you're one of several hundred. Um, I ask everybody to conduct themselves with civility, to speak to the issues. Uh, we conduct the meeting under Robert's rules of order, um, and um, I will do my best to interpret them accurately and fairly. Um, my peripheral vision is limited, and so you may have your hand up on this side of the room and I may not see you. What I'm going to try to do is just go back and forth in calling people across the room so I don't get stuck in one place and not see somebody on the far side who wants to speak. Um, think about what you'd like to say is the advice I'd give you and try to get to the point. Uh, I don't think I've ever had to do this, but in the moderator trainings, if you go on too long, I'm supposed to say something like, could you get back to the point of the question? Because maybe you've taken a few detours in your long, if you talk for too long. Please use the mic. You may feel like you've got one of those voices that everybody can hear, but as somebody past 60, I can tell you I don't hear as well as I once did, and I'm not, I know I'm not alone in the room, so wait for one of the mic runners to get to you so, so that everyone can hear what you've got to say. Um, please take side conversations outside. Um, it doesn't take too long for the background noise in this room to get so that people cannot hear each other very well. Um, moderators often get in trouble when we try to rush things along, when we don't explain things well. So every time we get to an article and we're ready to vote, I will try to read the article in full to you. If you're confused about what we're about to do or what we're about to vote on, or you think the procedure is wrong, you can ask for a point of information or a point of order. You can also challenge the ruling of a moderator if I rule in a way you think is wrong. And a majority of you agree with a person who disagrees with my ruling, says I was wrong then we'll proceed in a different way, and I won't take it personally. Um, a couple things about how we interact with each other and uh, talk with each other uh, through this process. One is to speak through the moderator, to not make it personal. You may disagree passionately with your neighbor, but don't try not to let it get personal, and by directing your comments to me, um, that can diffuse some of that personal feeling. Now, I have to say, when, once some years ago, I was moderating a meeting. I can't remember if it was on ancient roads or it was on where the town office was going to be, but it got pretty passionate. And this one person was waving his arm and pointing his finger at me. And I said, finally said, you know, I, this, this is not my proposal. And he said, I know, but you told me to talk to you. <laughs> and he was right. Um, there are three ways to vote. One is by voice. Uh, one is by asking for a division of the House where we'll raise hands. And to do that, you will need one of these cards, which if you've checked in with the Board of Civil Authority, they've given you one. 
If you haven't got one of these and we have a division, you'll need one in order for your vote to be counted. If seven of you request a ballot, a paper ballot on an issue, that can happen as well, okay? You can choose to amend an article, you can choose to amend an amendment. We will probably stop right at that point because by the time you um, get beyond that, it gets really, really confusing and hard for people to figure out what's going on. Um, we usually stop the proceedings when, an art, when we get done with an article, when our state representative, Janet Ansel, arrives, and she usually gives us a short report on what's going on at the State House. So with that, um, as a general introduction to how this meeting will work, uh, we are on Article 2, which is to ask questions about the reports of town boards and officers. So are there such questions from anybody? Mac. Uh, Matt Gardner-Morris, uh, I just wonder if the treasurer could speak to the delinquent taxes. I think it was something like 200,000 and delinquent taxes were seen really high to me. And I just wonder if hopefully that number is going down and, and, and uh, you know, you just, I don't know, just $200,000 from delinquent taxes is really high to me. Hi, I'm Sandra, I'm your treasurer, and I'm happy to speak to that. Uh, the 2018 delinquent taxes are roughly $6,000. At the close of 2019, that would be in December, the delinquent taxes or the taxes outstanding were $190,000, and to date we've collected $96,000. So the goal is to get the balance of that in by the end of the fiscal year. Um, the select board has worked very closely with me. We keep we report every month on the delinquent taxes. And honestly, we are in, you have fewer delinquent taxes outstanding from prior years than you have had in, in, in a few years. So, we're, I think we're going to be fine. Any other questions? <laughs> and yes, that's high. But people do the best they can to pay. So sometimes people get behind or they need just a couple of extra months. Other questions? <laughs> Good morning, I'm Craig Lyon. I live on Old West Church Road. I had a couple questions about the report of the town hall renovation project. One being, I'm curious what fuel source was ended up being installed for the uh, boiler. And also, I've asked each year and have never, I guess, received a clear answer, but is it the intent of the town to again hold town meeting in the town hall. Was, um, wait for him, get a microphone, please. I can't speak to what fuel source, because I don't remember. John, do you know, can you tell us? Is it gas? Yeah, propane. Propane, okay. And the other question, Craig, that you have is we haven't made a decision on whether or not to go back to holding town meeting at the town hall because it's been out of service for several years. So I'd be curious to know, maybe a hand vote, what do people think? Do they want town meeting back at the town hall or does it work well here? Okay, well, what if you wanted to be at the town hall? You only get one hand there. Okay, and what about leaving it here at the school? Huh, okay, well that's good to know. We'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Other questions? Paul Hannon and then Stephanie, I think you wanted to say something. I'm still Paul Hannon. Um, <clears throat> this is, I'm not sure there's a question at the end of this, but I'll see. <laughs> this has to do with the Conservation Commission's report. I noticed that much of the report, perhaps most of the report, and perhaps most of their work over the past year has had to do with the uh, of the National Horror. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that the 
three most comforting, comforting words in that section of the report are with landowner approval. And maybe the four most troubling uh, words are the town's ash trees. Now the T in town is small, and so maybe that was referring to everybody's ash trees. But the point I want to make is that the trees are the right of way to the landowner. And so I think a lot more of the, 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 the uh, with, with landowner approval section really was the comment had to do with marking trees, and I'm just hopeful that it really refers to all of the activities contemplated for uh, treatment of ash trees at the right of way. Because again, the town has an easement for highway purposes over your land if the town road runs through it. But they don't own the trees. And so um, I, I just took a drive up in my section of Max Gray Road looking for ash trees. And I don't really have very many. But I've got an awful lot of hemlock. And so if the hemlock will be in Delta, got its toehold pretty healthily in central Vermont, uh, you probably be, want to be looking at my hemlock trees. But I'd like to manage those myself. And I've got to believe that most of the landowners would feel the same way. It gets complicated uh, with respect to this for highway purposes. For highway purposes, clearly there's a hazard tree in terms of improved site distance. Sure, I don't think that, I don't think you need uh, landowner permission, but when you're sort of prospectively trying to deal with a problem that may or may not be as bad as we think it's going to be, I don't think you should be prospectively cutting down people's ash trees. Um, so, the, the other trouble part of it is the contemplation of planting trees in the right of way. It kind of raises the question of whose trees are they become and who gets to control them. And uh, I don't know, I sound like a very private property rights guy all of a sudden, but, but I guess I am in this case. Um, so there's a bill in the legislature that muddies the water even further because there's currently a statute talking about shade trees and tree warning. This would change the definition of shade tree to public tree and put the, put the, um, the, the, the power of the tree warden to declare what's a public tree. Oof. So I don't know. It's, it seems like it's a kind of a muddy situation when we're talking about shade trees. And I totally get it with the word of concern about um, a, a pest coming in and devastating our ash trees. But uh, I, I really hope it's all consultation with the proposal of the Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Kaplan. I'm the chair of the Palace Conservation Commission. And fortunately, we can assure and reassure Paul that we are fully aware that the landowners um, own the trees in the right of way, that uh, we would not be doing anything um, without landowner permission, and um, as Paul probably understands, in order to cut any of the trees that are in the right of way, the town right of way, but the trees that are owned by the landowner, um, the landowners would be notified um, individually, and then if they requested it, there would be a public hearing before any trees were taken down. So. Um, I wanted to also just give a little update about what the Calais Conservation Commission has done in this last year and sort of where things stand. Um, there's a table in the back, we have a table in the back that's got a, a lot of information about what we're doing and also what landowners, private landowners can do. You have to understand that uh, when I say we, I'm talking about the town and um, Again, it only would affect trees in the town right away. Um, trees on your land that's not in the private right of way, you have to take care of yourselves. And there are suggestions, there are some publications back there with suggestions about what to do. Um, I assume that you're all aware after all this time about the Amber Lash Borer that destroys ash trees. And um, in the Midwest and the East Coast, where the infestations have occurred, uh, close to 100% of the ash trees die 
eventually after they're infested by this little emerald green thing, um, they lay eggs under the bark and the larva <clears throat> tunnel around and then the tree can't get nutrients and water that it needs and they die. Um, one of the, also as Paul pointed out, in the town report there's kind of a detailed explanation of um, what the conservation has been working on. Uh, last year, as I reported at town meeting, we got a $2,000 grant um, in order to, from, the, from the state in order to come up with a management plan. And as many of you know, we conducted an inventory and there were a lot of volunteers and there was this little app from the forestry program and uh, people went around 60 some miles of callous roads punching in this little app when they saw an ash tree and then also indicating whether it was considered hazardous in the sense that it fell to fall on the road or a building. Um, so there were, of the inventory that was done on those roads, there were a total of 3,297 ash trees identified, which is kind of shocking to me, it was a shockingly high amount of ash trees because it means that Eventually, these trees are going to be gone. So there are several possibilities of how to deal with them, and none of them are good. We don't like any of them, but uh, we have to deal with them. And one of the problems with ash trees is that as they die and when they're dead, they get very brittle. So how and where they fall is unpredictable, and they're kind of dangerous to deal with. Um, arborists don't like uh, dealing with um, dead ash trees. So there are several possibilities. We've outlined them there very quickly. We could cut, we could, we could have cut all the ash trees on all the roads preemptively. Um, we could have identification of the most hazardous ones and then figure out how to take those down. We just, and there's also a possibility of insecticide treatment if there are very special trees. Um, so we're going to have a public meeting sometime in the spring, maybe early summer, because before we finalize what we're doing, we need public input. And then ultimately it's up to the select board to decide. Um, so I also, uh, we really hope that people come. We had a great uh, turnout for the inventory. We had a lot of volunteer help for that. Um, and then, I, again, I wanted to emphasize that um, we're not going to be doing anything with ash trees without landowner permission. Um, the other thing is, is that you should be aware that we're doing a little project of identifying um, where there's a density of ash trees on um, kind of highly traveled roads. We're going to be um, putting up some little signs so that just to heighten awareness that these are ash trees going to be gone someday. This is why, um, for more information, and also, uh, so the roads are, there's more information back there about it, uh, little sections of Lightning Ridge, West County Road, and North Palos Road. There's also a map on, on some literature back there that shows um, the density of the ash trees along the various roads. Um, and I just wanted to say one more quick thing, and it doesn't have anything to do with ash trees, it has to do with the Bliss Pond Town Forest. I just also wanted to draw your attention to the information in the town report about that and the fact that we are going to be having public meetings about what to do about the future of the Blizzard Town Forest. And we really hope that we get a good turnout because we really want to know what you think. Thank you. Okay, we are on Article 2 um, to ask questions about reports of town boards and officers. Anybody else? Yes, in the middle here. Hi, I'm Millie really Brown Back. I live on the New York Road. Um, a question I had was about the roads report. I understand that the um, people who work for the town um, want to have a union representation. And I'd like to, I didn't see any update on it, and I'd like to hear an update on the progress on the unionization of the road crew. Thank you. Yes, the road crew has opted to join the union, which they have a right to do that. 
Negotiations are underway and are confidential while we're negotiating. Once the contract is signed and sealed, it, it then becomes a public document. And that's really all I can say about it right now because it's confidential. Follow up question. Uh, yeah, wait for the mic, please. About how long are we looking at? What are we are we talking six months? Are we talking a year? They don't seem to know anything about anything. They that's not so. They have a union representative that who we are, can't meet with you is what I understand. Who what? That you guys won't meet with them. I don't know where you're getting your information from, but it's not accurate. Um, that might be their perception. We have had select board meetings with the union and the road crew. We have um, continually met, the, the select board met, for instance, last night. To to, in, private deliberations. Yeah, we, we, these are in private deliberations and our town attorney has advised that we don't have to warn those meetings. We are working as hard as we can work. We got the union request, the contract, right during the middle of getting ready for budget preparation for the town report, which you have. So we are working diligently and in good faith to move this along. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else on Article 2 to ask questions about the town reports or of the town officers? You can ask to be recognized, sure. I just wanted to make sure. You, you need to use a microphone. Sorry, I thought I had a big mouth. Um, Nobody can comment on that, though. <laughs> so I just wanted to introduce, have everybody make sure that they know all of the board members. John Brabant, I live over on Singleton Road. Denise Wheeler, Bain Camoli Road. Cliff Emmons, I live on County Road. Good morning, welcome. It's so nice to see so many people here. I'm Rose Pelchuk. I live at the top of Lakeland Ridge. Always fun to speak after Rose. I'm Sharon Wynn. I live on Tucker Road. Okay. I just, again, I just wanted to take a moment for everyone to recognize your select board. They work really, really, really hard and they take a lot of time, a lot of patience, a lot of work outside of meetings that people don't know. For instance, the union negotiations, putting together information for the town report, attending other meetings of other boards and commissions, going to trainings. Um, I noted in here that we had 37 meetings. Those were 37 <coughs> meetings that were public meetings. So um, I just want you to recognize how hard these folks all work all the time for the better of the town and for the residents. So I'd like you to give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Craig Lyon would like the microphone. Wait for it to come down. It's on its way. It's only a comment about the actual town report. Uh, I'm sorry that the contact information is on page 11 and 12. I really like having it inside the front cover or the back cover. Um, it's an easy reference. I don't remember all the phone numbers. So for future reports, it's often been right in the front or in the back. Anyone else on Article 2? Okay, we will move on to Article 3 to elect town officers from the floor. The first officer up for election is town agent. I believe Tina Bielenberg is the incumbent. Uh, the floor is open for nominations. I nominate Tina Bielenberg. Do we have a second? Second. Any other nominations? If not, would somebody like to move that we close nominations and have the clerk uh, put in one ballot for Tina Bielenberg? So moved. Do we have a second to that? Second. 
To all those in favor of closing nominations and having the clerk uh, cast one ballot for Tina B. Lindenberg, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, she is reelected. Trustee of Public Funds, this is a three-year term. I believe Rod Buck is the incumbent. Nominations are open. I nominate Rod Buck. Do we have a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other nominations? If not, can we have a motion to close nomination and have the clerk cast one ballot for so Rod moved. Buck? Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we close nominations and have the clerk cast one ballot for Rod Buck. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next job is cemetery commissioner. This is a five-year term. We have a nomination. Yes? I nominate Randy Koch. Okay, do we have a second? Any other nominations? Not seeing any. Can we have a motion to have the clerk cast, close nominations and have the clerk cast one ballot for Randy Koch? So moved. Do we have a second? All those in favor of closing nominations and having the clerk re-elect Randy Koch, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you all. Article 4 says, shall the, town, shall the voters approve a total highway and general fund expenditures of $1,661,574, of which $1,354,449 shall be raised by taxes and $307,125 by non-tax revenue. Uh, Denise, did you want to move this yes. article? so moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. We're open for discussion. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, On page 41 of the budget, deposits with insurance companies, can you explain what that is? Sandra? Sandra. Yes. And, uh, that uh, refers to the HRA deposit with our third party administrator health equity. So it's an accounting, um, it's a way the accountants account for that money that belongs to the town, but is held by a third party for the town's benefit. Other discussion of this article? Yes, in the middle, I need to wait for the mic to get to you. I was just wondering um, how you raise that amount of money um, by non-tax revenue. What, how do we get money without taxes? <laughs> some of that money is from grants. Some of it is, um, it's grants for different projects. Sandra can probably give you more detail. Hi, Molly. <laughs> So that money uh, refers to state aid to highways. It refers to our current use payments, our pilot funds, the money that the town clerk's office generates. And there is a list of our revenues. And if you give me a second, I can, I, page, page 50, you'll see our um, anticipated revenues for FY21 and months. Anything else on Article 4? If not, yep. let's see. Hmm? Yep, okay. Just a question on it. With Wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> with the, uh, just a question here. Uh, with uh, negotiations, getting negotiations going on with the union, do you have uh, flexibility in your, in your wage line if for any, anything going on there? The wages for FY21 are set. Anything with the union, I can't really give you a good answer. I mean, they, it depends on what the negotiations bring. I'll just leave it at that because, I, like I said, they're confidential. And just for clarification, this is a first ever unionization effort. 
for our highway crew. And first contracts are different than renegotiating contracts that are expire or about to expire. You have to get it right because the first contract is what future contracts are all premised upon. So um, you head down inadvertently down a, a, a path that may not be optimal looking back and you get a real difficulty kind of backtracking. In fact, it's, it's called regressive bargaining um, <clears throat> once you reopen it. So, um, so that, that's why we're being really measured um, this time around. We're, we would be measured anyway, but we're being ultra careful so that we get it right. And that's, that's in the interest of not only the town or the work of the town, but also the workers that we get it right for them. So we want to make sure that we are seen as a, a good employer, a good place to come to work for, um, and that, uh, you know, and people stick around. So we're not trying to screw the employees. Um, we want to make sure that we can maintain to the extent we can, we, uh, can the, ben the wage and benefits that we're already providing them, which are on par or better uh, than we're surrounding towns. So um, that's kind of the philosophy we're going into this, went into this with, and continue to um, apply as we negotiate. Okay, are you ready for Article 4? Seeing no hands, Article 4 reads, shall the voters approve total highway and general fund expenditures of $1,661,574, of which $1,354,449 shall be raised by taxes and $307,125 by non-tax revenue. All those in favor of Article 4, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Article 4 passes. Article 5, shall the voters appropriate the sum of $49,400 for the operation and maintenance of the town's cemeteries? Is there someone to move this article? So moved. It's been moved. Do we have a second? Anybody want to speak to this article? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 5 to appropriate the sum of $49,400 for the operation and maintenance of the town's cemeteries, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Article 5 passes. Article 6, shall the voters authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed $18,500 for a term not to exceed three years for the purchase of a new town office server. Can somebody move this article? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Does anyone want to speak to this article? Cliff, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, just so everyone understands, uh, and it's kind of in the select board report as well, our IT infrastructure uh, in general, the hardware, needs to be replaced about every four or five years. Our existing server is at the five-year point, and when you get into six years on a server, it, uh, it's the clock's ticking, something bad's gonna happen. So what we're doing is um, going to upgrade the server. This will complete a full upgrade of all our IT infrastructure. We should be good for about four years after that. We also will be meeting with our IT service provider annually to do a gap analysis to make sure that we're properly funding our technology fund, that we're not overfunding or underfunding it, so that going forward, we won't need to take out a loan again. We'll already have the money in the bank. Thank you. Okay, we have a hand up over here. At the risk of hearing my own voice again, being at least two-thirds a Luddite, a part of me is saying, wow, really every four years? I mean, I know it's, it's a bigger deal than just replacing my laptop every 17 years, I don't know. Uh, it sounds like a lot of money, $4,000 a year, or only or 18,000 is only gonna last four years. It, really, is that, is that what is normal? Unfortunately, where we are with technology, it is. Um, the hope is, going forward, these things will become less expensive over time, and that the technology will advance to a point where we can all save money, but we're not quite there yet. 
The other big factor, uh, as Denise is referring to, is the security. Uh, the technology and the software is always advancing, and you have to make sure your hardware can keep up with it to maintain the security that's required. Anyone else on this article? Seeing no hands, uh, it seems we're ready for the question. And the question is, shall the voters offer, authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to see, exceed $18,500 for a term not to exceed three years for the purchase of a new town office server? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Or, or the, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it in Article 6 passes. Article 7, shall the voters appropriate the sum of $30,000 to paint the exterior of the town hall? Uh, does someone want to move this article, someone. Denise? Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. We're open for discussion. Yep, in front here. Is this $30,000 in addition to the $30,000 going into the fund? Yes. So this is going to be $60,000 to the town hall this year? Well, this is for, um, we will go out to bid for this painting um, job, you know, do RFPs and do the things the way we should do them. So this is for the town hall painting, the town hall reserve fund. I don't think that's not 30000 I think that's only ten. Look on page, where is it? Um, we, tried to, we tried to rearrange things a little bit on, um, in here, okay, on page 46, 46, where it says town hall, town hall reserve appropriation 10. Well, no, eight, because we're talking FY21 right now. We're already in FY20. So that's FY21, so we, Reduce it a little bit because we want to have money to paint. Does that answer your question, Matt? Yes, indeed. Anybody else on this article? Yeah, we've got a couple hands on this side. We'll go lower and then higher. I'm Linda Sheets, and I was down at the town hall the other day picking up things for the town lunch, and I was just breathless how beautiful it is inside. And John was the only person there working. And I think he and a couple other people have been doing all the floors themselves. The stairway going, the back stairway is absolutely beautiful. I couldn't believe it. The whole building, I think we just need to give a huge appreciation to John and his crew. I'd make an amendment just to make that minor change. Okay. All right, do we have a second to the amendment? It's 
I moved and seconded that we amend the article so it says up to $30,000 discussion of the amendment. Yes, Mike is coming. Be patient. Uh, Donna Fitch, Town Hall Renovation Committee. We did get one quote, and as Denise said, by the time we got the quote, it was already in the town report for $30,000. And that quote was for $58,000. So they will go out to bid, the select board will, and we may have to add some money onto this $30,000, maybe from the reserve fund, the town hall reserve fund. Um, but the town hall really needs to be painted this year because um, we've had repairs done to some of the clappers and they only have primer. And our contractor said they really need to be painted within a year. So we will have to add some more money to this $30,000 from someplace. And it could be fundraising from the friends of the town hall. Um, so it is going to cost more than $30,000, but you know, the select board will go out to bid. We just really don't have a firm figure right now. Okay, further discussion of the amendment. Yes, over there. Uh, do we have options for ensuring that you've got enough to do what you, I mean, do you have enough in reserve elsewhere that you can tap if she got overrun, or is there a way we can, you know, incre increase here the money that you need to do the job? You can make an amendment to increase the amount of money. We will look at the town hall reserve fund. It's for the maintenance of the town hall. So some money could come out from there. Um, like I said, we already put this to bed before we had, you know, solicited at least one quote, which took a while to get. Oh, I get that. I mean, what, what would you like us to do to enable this so that you're not stalling in the stream? And I, I mean, if you have an idea of what, I, I'm glad to put out an amendment to increase that. Don't we look, we could look for donations. You could increase the amount to forty or 50000 to paint the building. It's up to the legislative body here to decide. Well, then I would offer an amendment to, uh, to increase that dollar line to up to $50,000 if needed. Uh, for the okay, so what I'm going to suggest here is that we vote on the prior amendment, and first. if we vote it down, and then we get back to the main question, you could then amend it to go upward if that would make sense because it would be hard to go. I think it'll confuse people to go back and forth. So are you ready for the question, which is to limit this article to up to $30,000? If so, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. And we're back to the main question and your Amendment would now be in order. And so I propose an amendment to increase the lot, the about the lot of the painting to fifty thousand dollars versus up to up to, up to, up to fifty thousand dollars. And is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded to amend the article so it says up to fifty thousand dollars. Discussion over here. How much money is now in the reserve fund for the town hall? We were just we were just looking um, at the time that this was printed. Sandra, do you have an up-to-date figure? I Sandra, our treasurer has an up-to-date figure. Thank you. Uh, Ten thousand eight hundred dollars. So with the addition of the appropriation in FY21, that was part of the budget, we just voted in, there would be $18,000 at the start of FY21, which is July 1st, 2020. If I may, I am all in favor of this project. Always have been. We approved $200,000 for memory service a couple years ago. Um, rather than Increase the amount to fifty thousand. I think uh, since everything is recently done, I would rather use the contingency reserve fund to put towards painting, and then continue to build that fund later. With the thinking that we just did everything 
we won't need maintenance right off the bat. Okay. That's probably true, but if there isn't, if the amount is 30,000 and there's gonna be 18,000, that's 48, and it's likely to cost 50 to 50 to 55,000 or something like that to do this big project. Are you, so are you suggesting going back to the original amount? I'm not clear. Yes, I'm arguing against this amendment oh. of 50,000. I am in favor of leaving it at 30,000 using the reserve fund and then fundraising from the friends group or finding, you're tapping into the slush fund. Don't have a slush fund. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we did. <laughs> Further discussion? Okay, the amendment on the floor would be to change this article from $30,000 to up to $50,000. Are you ready for that question, which is to amend the article? It's, Yes, John. Just for clarification, doesn't mean we have to spend everything. If we get a low bid, if it comes to a lower bid than we currently anticipated, if it came to 45, the remaining amount would remain in the, the reserve fund and uh, be applied going forward. We happily accept donations. We happily accept donations. Okay, we have a hand up here and then. And how many other bidders have you identified or potential bidders? We haven't gone out to bid yet. I mean, the select board will do that. We just got one quote, so we have some idea. I mean, you know, it does seem high on all of us. Well, I think in part, some of that is because of the lead remediation that has to be done that was in the quote we received. Okay, we have a hand in the middle. We've got the ball. Paul. Paul has uh, I guess I'm a little troubled uh, bumping this uh, as much on, based on one estimate. But my question is, does anybody know what the Old West Church cost to paint? <laughs> Shocked, aren't you? <laughs> is there anyone? What did it done? A little bit under 30000 but there's a, you know, there was more porches at the town. It, it actually was painted by the same person we got the quote from for the town hall. Um, and there's a little more going on at the town hall as far as porches and things and stuff. Okay, we have a hand up over here. So my concern is about the lead remediation. Was the lead remediation a part of the Old West Church painting quote? Yes. Okay, so we are, on, uh, we are on an amendment to this article that would authorize up to $50,000, yes? I'm just curious where the $30,000 came from to begin with that went to the budget. Where did that come Old West Church. <laughs> Further discussion? If not, we'll vote on the amendment which would authorize up to $50,000 for the painting of the town hall. All those in favor of amending the article in that fashion, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The division of the House has been called for. So those in favor of the article, hold your hands up. You're going to try to do this visually to begin with. If you're in favor of the up to 50,000, hold your cards up. Okay, put your hands down. Those who are opposed, put your cards up. And I believe that the eyes have it. And you have amended the article. So we are now on the main question which is, shall the voters approve the sum of up to $50,000 to paint the exterior of the town hall? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And the article has been, amended, has been approved at up to $50,000. Article 8, shall the voters authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed $25,000 
for a term not to exceed four years for the purchase of a used wood chipper. Would somebody like to move this article? So moved. It's been moved. Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Okay, we'll get your microphone in a second. I absolutely support this um, this item um, as more and more ash trees die and collapse in our roadways. We're going to need a way to deal with, I'm anticipating, a huge amount of branch wood and more than could normally be tucked away. So I think at, at this time, with the ash, with the, with the problem of the ash trees, we really need a chipper. Um, I would like to amend the article to read uh, for the last phrase, for the one-time purchase of a used wood chipper. One-time purchase means that when this chipper needs replacement, the purchase must be brought before the town as a new item on the town warning. And the reason that's important is that if we don't amend it that way, then we are gonna to have to own a chipper forever. That's the tradition of the town. Once we buy a piece of big equipment, it goes into the capital, highway capital plan, and that's it. So if, if, we, if, we buy the, if we go with the article as written, it's gonna cost us four or $5,000 a year uh, to purchase this, this item. But then it's going to continue to cost us four or five thousand dollars a year every year to re to replace it. And a used chipper with this amount of work it's going to get is probably not going to last all that long. If, however, if we uh, go with my amendment, then we will be we will pay uh, twenty five thousand dollars or so one time for a chipper. It'll cost five thousand dollars a year or so, and then that'll be it. And then if the highway department can make an argument after that that we still need a chipper, let them come to us and convince us. Thank you. Okay, discussion of the amendment. We have a hand up here. Not of the amendment. Of the amendment. Cassidy, yeah. Doesn't the amendment have to be seconded? Okay, we thought it was. It was seconded. Was seconded. Okay. You seconded it. Uh, Scott did, but okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, it's been moved and seconded between the two of them. Uh, discussion? Yes, in, in the way back. Why would you guys like rent one? You don't need to buy one. Rent one. Instead of wasting the town money buying one, you're probably going to three or four times. So, have it set there and just rent it as you need it. Could you just repeat yourself? Not everybody could hear you without the microphone. You can rent them. Rent one when you need it. Rent it when you don't need it. You don't need it. I mean, why just employ waste the town's money into something you're probably going to do maybe three or four times and just sit there and rust? Rent it as you need it. So, so well, um, I don't disagree with the thought because I think everyone on this select board started out in that place, and between running the numbers and dealing with availability, when people are chipping, they're all chipping at once. So getting a rental item, they'll say, well, we got it for the last two weeks uh, in July, and we might have one available in September. And when we're, when we're chipping all summer, which we anticipate, we're going to be chipping nonstop now. We, we are we're mowing our roadside. We're trying to keep the brush back. And it's rather than loading stuff into our trucks, which is, which is what the guys are also doing when they cut the brush back, and then hauling it to some place, finding a landowner to let us dump them, dump the limbs, um, they can chip as they move down the road. So we're trying to actually save money with this. And by the way, renting chippers is not cheap. This is, I, I've gone around um, on the internet and looked at pricing of these, and there are uh, leasing companies that lease these chippers, and they're in, a, I'm amazed at what good shape they're in, and they're pretty young machines. And, but they drop in price a pretty good amount. So we're, we're looking at a, a, a good quality, really a high-end wood chipper, uh, and they do fall in this range. Um, I mean, they're basically half price, and they're well-maintained. So we're, we're look, for instance, if you know much about them, Vermeer makes a real high-end diesel-powered chipper. 
that's their trailer chipper, big, big machines. You know, we have one from the city of yeah, yeah. So, um, and then you know we we have road crew guys going back and forth picking up and dropping off chippers. It just doesn't work. And uh, if it did, that's what we would be doing for sure. Yeah, it won't be sitting around rusting, I assure you. I hope not. It'll get worn out, probably. I'm sick of buying stuff and having to sit around and waste money. I mean, we yep. buy stuff, we got to use it. Yep. You can't just let it sit there and run. Well, we have two graders, and both graders run during grading season. All right, so. Okay, we are on the amendment, and the amendment makes this a one time purchase. Is there further discussion of the amendment? Yes, right in front there. Yep. Yes, uh, I see on page 51, uh, says Article A, use wood chipper for $7,000. Where, What's that about? Where, where? Page 51, about two thirds down the page. Other expenses to be voted on. It's in a list of about six of them, yeah. Article 5 through 10. Yes, wait for the microphone. So. I was going to ask that same question, and I just made the assumption that on page 51, number 8, that amount is a quarter of the 25000 so it's a it's a FY21 budgeted amount. Is that that's correct? correct. Yeah. Because the loan would be for. You need to use the microphone. The the loan is for four years. So the twenty five thousand we spread out over the four years, and that's where the seven thousand comes from. Okay, we have a hand in the middle. I just don't understand why do you have to borrow. I don't understand why the town is having to borrow from these. There's a couple articles where money has to be borrowed. Can you explain that? You mean as opposed to an outright purchase? No. No. Why do you have to borrow? Well, to begin? well so we have two options. You can appropriate the full amount now, or you can we can take out a loan um, and finance the, the cost of the purchase that way. So the town doesn't have enough money to buy it out, right? We, we when we tax every year, we, we do have reserve funds, um, but we're supposed to tax based on a, an anticipated budget. We're not supposed to tax and then say, let's keep some extra money on the side in a box. We're supposed to actually tax based on what the anticipated costs of running this town annually are. We do have a town highway reserve fund um, a lot of that money is actually where we have spillover. We have money that goes unexpended, and then it winds up in there, and we do apply that. Um, but no, we, we look to you each year to pay, pay our bills each year. Okay. Yeah, we have $53,000 we're going to donate this year. The charities. Why, why are we keeping that money in town? You can vote against that. No kidding. I know that. Just the, every year it's the same thing. It really ticks me off if people are reaching into my pocket and pulling out money for their favorite charities, which I may or may not like. But I have to give because 50% plus one or more say that that is a justifiable cause. Okay, we have a hand up in the back here. Yep. Hi, Fletcher Dean. Uh, with the wood chipper, are the uh, chips going to be just deposited in place or will they be hauled somewhere? Will they be available for townspeople to use for their own landscaping? And um, or would they be uh, just, you know, for composting on the side of the road? It's my understanding if they chip something in front of your house, just like if there's a tree cut down at your house, that wood belongs to you. Uh, if there's a whole bunch of it, I'm not sure. We'll probably have to stockpile it somewhere and then it would be available to the residents. So there's small brush that gets chipped. I expect that's just gonna be blown into the woods. But like Denise said, if there's a, a big uh, tree getting chipped uh, and otherwise cut up, we cut the, we buck up the tree wood and we leave it on the side of the road and we could, the property owner wanted us not to spray it into the woods. We could, you know, with advance notice, 
put in a pile, I expect. Okay, Stephanie, and then Millie, and then the woman just below Millie. And just so we're clear, what we're on right now is a proposed amendment to this article to make this a one-time purchase. Well, um, that's one of the things I wanted to speak to. It sounds like we're going way beyond what the amendment is, and I want to speak to the original article, but I don't want to lose the opportunity because it sounds like we're talking about the merits of the article. And I have another point of order, and that is I would ask the moderator to please ask people to identify themselves when they speak. Thank you. So let, can we get to the amendment? Okay. Yeah, Scott offered an amendment that made this a one-time a one -time purchase. So, Millie, do you want to speak to that issue? Well, why don't we, we are on the amendment, not on the chipper itself. So once we've modified the article or not, we get to the main question, I think is the point the prior speaker was trying to make. Yes, Craig? I the question on the amendment. Okay, the question of whether to stop debate on the amendment has been called, and that takes two thirds of you. So if you're ready to stand that, we will still go back to the main question and you can decide whether to get a chipper at all or not, whether to finance it at all or not. With those in favor of adding Scott's language that this be a one-time purchase, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The article is amended. So we're now on the article itself as amended, which makes this a one-time purchase. And we'll go to Millie and then to the woman in front of her. I just wanted to comment on the condition around on the roads and the brush that needs to be cleared. I can't remember the brush being quite as bad as it is, has been the last two or three years. Sometimes it makes it hard to see in places. And whatever we need to do to get that brush taken care of, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And lady there. And please identify yourselves as you go along. Hi, I'm Tara. I'm on a Nico Corner. So I'm just curious how um, this relates. You know, we're talking about the four. And I'm curious, um, as the crews are going out, and you're going to be using a wood chipper or doing the cutting, um, is there any training on looking for invasive species? And then just chopping that up and taking that wherever, um, does that then just spread if there's a problem? Um, you know, we don't necessarily want to you know, does it need to be burned? Or I mean, I just connect between the sorry, conversation. So Stephanie Kaplan can speak best to this. She's the chair of our conservation commission. But the town is taking invasive species and these invasive bugs pretty seriously, um, as are many towns in Vermont. Um, we have a chervil problem. Folks know about that. It's wild parsnip. Um, these things are inundating our roadsides. Disturbed areas tend to see them more often. Um, down in Randolph, they're invading hay fields to the point where hay fields can't be used for animal feed, which is a concern. I know it's a selfish concern here. Um, so what we've, we've done a number of things. This chipper is part of the program, um, and Stephanie's going to be able to speak to this in more depth. Um, but we've also purchased, out of our reserve fund, a used uh, roadside mowing setup. Um, it was purchased from a tractor, Rennie, Rennie Fournier, up in Swanton. It came from ta a, a small town in Connecticut. And we're going to be able to get on and keep up with the roadside mowing uh, better than we have really ever had a plan. Um, so we can get at these invasives before they go to seed, hopefully many before they even go to flower. So there's that. And in terms of the emerald ash borer, um, I'll let the rest of this go to Stephanie. Thank you. Um, a couple, um, yeah, a couple things. Um, I'm curious about the would be really used for chipping this low vegetation. I think the chipper's more for branches and you know pieces of tree. Um, but I do want to address that briefly and just say that the Conservation Commission last year worked with the mower in order to try to time, to work out the best timing 
of when to cut what. And it's very complicated because there's different times in the summer that some spread and some don't. But as far as the chipper and the emerald ash borer, I really wanted to address this. I think the last time the question of purchasing a chipper came up, I was opposed to it. But now that I've been dealing with the emerald ash borer, what we learned recently is that, you know, as you probably know, and should know if you don't, that you're not allowed to move ash trees out of town. I think it's town. I mean, there's a quarantine on moving ash trees because that's the quickest way for the ash borer to spread. But when they're chipped, apparently, when the branches or the parts of the tree are chipped, it either kills the larva or it dries. This is what Neil Maker, our tree warden, explained recently, that the chips dry out right away, and therefore there's nothing for the borer to be, I guess, eating or benefiting from. So that once it's chipped, those chips can be moved around. So I now support buying a chipper because there's going to be a lot of dead ash trees, along with whatever trees, other trees just naturally die. And I do believe that chipping them is the best, going to be the best way to deal with it. Thank you. OK, we have a hand up over in the grandstand. Uh, yeah, my name is Walter Wazinski from the Bliss Pond community. Uh, I've got two questions. One is, is there a process for determining if we do purchase outright or take out a loan for any particular item in these articles, is that something the select board deliberates and strategizes against? Or just curious how that happens. The other one is, do do towns get a better uh, interest rate on a loan, or is it basically what we see down at the bank is what we'd be getting uh, from the town when we take money out for a purchase like this? I think that um, I'll, I can answer part of it, but probably the treasurer, Sandra, could answer it better. Um, if we borrow money for more than one fiscal year, we have to go before the voters. And I'm not sure I understood the first part of your question. Just the five versus five. Five versus oh, spreading out the tree. Oh, buying versus what, renting? I mean, I don't know. Purchasing. I, I think the question is, why do you want to pay for this over three years? How do you think about that oh, as do. opposed to spending $25,000 this year? We have talked about this at select board meetings over and over and over again to find the best means to get a piece of equipment. And in this case, it was decided that the best way to do it was to spread the money out over the four years. That's why you see seven thousand and sixty six dollars or whatever it is for the four years rather than trying to come rather than eating the whole thing at one time yeah that's the question i was just wondering if there was the strategy behind it oh yeah select board level yeah yeah we and talked about anything it. to do with the uh, total amount any given year that we'd be that you'd be asking us to approve that's, that's just my assumption but i just yeah. wanted to make sure that the decisions in here, whether we're going to take a loan out and incur interest or make an outright right. purchase, are being deliberated. And oh, yeah. Ad, ad, ad nauseum. <laughs> okay, we are on Article 8 as you've amended it. Uh, Craig, you get the microphone next. A quick question, which John skirted a bit. Why not take it out of the equipment reserve fund and relate it? how much is in that fund, and related, when, what are we anticipating next year or the year after in terms of other equipment needs, truck replacement, et cetera? I can answer some of those questions, and they're all fair questions. Um, so we, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, we did purchase a roadside mowing uh, setup. It's a, a tractor, and it's got sidearm mowers, um, and we paid cash for that out of the equipment reserve fund. So full tank moving down, and the, and the gauge is showing somewhat less than when we started then. And I was hoping we could do the chipper cash as well, and we were informed that we don't have the, enough, enough in the reserve to do that. Therefore, the loan, um, you know. Uh, what, was he just, what else did you ask? I'd really like to know how much is in the reserve fund. Sandra, maybe. 
Sandra? Sandra's going to answer that in a second here. She's digging. 25,169 dollars and 59 cents. <laughs> that's pretty precise. That's after we've already purchased the tractor and mowing. Uh, that's, that, that surprises me that it's that low. Because I thought we were building, having a robust fund towards replacing a fire truck or dump trucks or seriously, that's all we've got in it. That, that surprises me. My understanding is that fund, based on what the voters indicated, is is leftover money. We money that goes unexpended goes in that reserve fund. Where's Peter Harvey? <laughs> yeah, we're he's right here. Okay, we have a hand up in the grandstand. And please identify yourself. Uh, Maria Mercedes from Jack Hill. Um, I was wondering, is there a possibility to make a down payment? I mean, would that affect the uh, try to benefit from that interest at all, or maybe it, doesn't, it won't make much of a difference? I don't understand. Your Right. So your thinking is, put, put a down payment to reduce the amount that needs to be borrowed. Is, is that a possibility? I mean, maybe it doesn't change the payments much. Maybe to help mm -hmm. lower the payments. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we could we could do that to the extent we have the ability financially to do that. Um, From whatever's left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sandra can address, Sandra can address the loan structure. Okay. So just to remind you, we are on Article 8. What it says is, shall, as amended, shall the voters authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed $25,000 for a term not to exceed four years for the one-time purchase of a used wood chipper. That's what we're discussing. Sandra? Hi. What, what the select board tries to do is to make works on its budget is to keep the tax rate as stable as possible from year to year to year, given the increases in costs that they simply have no control over. That would be fuel, that would be insurances, and so forth. So when they look at making a decision to borrow money or not, they're looking at what would happen to the tax rate if, an, if the entire amount of the anticipated purchase was added to the budget, because it has a direct effect on how much your taxes are. So some things you will see go in as a whole, and some things go in, as in this article, as a payment. So what we do is we'll go out to bid oftentimes on these um, particular items, this wood chipper, we have, I believe, a less than 3% interest rate from the Community Bank NA, um, as well as the server loan. So a, a lot of their deliberation is actually looking to keep your tax rate stable and, and as close to last year as possible. Um, does that, did that mean, oh, and actually out of the, uh, the highway fund was created here in town meeting, I believe in 2015, by the voters who said if the highway revenues are more than the highway expenses, that difference goes into the highway capital equipment fund. So some years, there's $40,000 that move over, and I believe we had that two years ago. And some years, there's just not that much. So to the extent, so the select board constantly um, works to make sure we have money in that fund and that we can um, pay what we need to pay and keep that tax rate stable. There is a payment, Craig, that comes out of that fund in January of $40,000. It's for one of the uh, Western Star trucks. So the thought process that the select board worked on was if we buy the chipper in full to save that 
2.75% interest, we may not have enough money to make that payment due in January 2021. So this is the balancing act that they work on at every meeting during the budget process. That's how it works. Okay, uh, Paul, you get the next question or a comment as soon as we get your microphone. It's on its way. I still fall that. Um, so I have a quick clarifying question first, which is, is there a difference between, we used a couple of terms here, is there a difference between the Highway Equipment Fund and the Highway Reserve Fund? No, same thing. There is a same thing. Same thing, okay, that's what I thought. And, and I did remember the putting the excess into that fund. I also think we used to appropriate a chunk to go in on a regular basis. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's in here, like it used to be or not. Uh, there, there is no amount of money in the budget to uh, direct or appropriate into the capital equipment fund for highway. It comes directly from um, the surplus, from expenses and revenues. So I guess with that in mind, I certainly wouldn't want to argue to take this money out of that fund because I think maybe we're sort of underfunding something that was a good idea at one time so that we didn't hit ourselves so hard when we had to replace a truck. But having said that, I think this is deja vu all over again. Last year this thing was in here as new for thirty thousand dollars. I made the argument against it then. Now it's in here used at twenty five thousand if I take John to this word we're actually looking at a arguably a $50,000 chipper that we're getting for sort of half price because we're going to get it used and it's in great shape and all that. But my fundamental question is, do we really need one that big if what we're chipping is brush and limbs? I, I rented a chipper a few years back that would have chipped, well, all of us, it's a little Fargo thing here, but um, uh, it was, sorry, it was huge. And, and I'd be surprised if that cost $30,000. It would take six inch stuff. And, and so if we're I mean, 25,000 for it, or 50 or 30, whatever, it seems like an awful lot of money if what we're really trying to do is chip brush. Yeah, I understand a big engine lasts longer than a small engine trying to do the same work, but I don't think we, I, I certainly wouldn't think that road companies chipping six inch stuff. They should be chipping the limbs and putting it down and then the rest of it. Laid there for the landowner. There we go again. The Just to be, oh, sorry. We were checking the minutes from last year. There was no article for the wood chipper last year. I think it might have been a couple of years ago. Well, I just, I just saw the, my name in there as uh, regarding the minutes talking about the thirty thousand dollar chipper. Now, if that was for the year before, I don't know what it was doing in last year's minutes. But anyway, that doesn't matter. The point, yeah. the point I'm trying to make is, it seems like a hell of a big chipper for for limbs. Limbs that maybe maybe as big as your forearm, uh, hopefully not all that bigger, and, and brush. So I guess I'm gonna vote against it again. So so just to clarify, it's a durability issue. You mentioned that, Paul. So we're trying to save you all money. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, the roadside mowing, we 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 were able to snag. I think Alfred went and looked at the equipment too. A uh, roadside mowing setup that you know is. It's going to pretty pretty quickly pay for itself, and uh, I dare say we'll get 10 years out of it. Um, that's got a sidearm mower that could mow the branches on the roadside. We we it might get ugly, so it's going to be there's going to be a property owner consultation done. Um, you may not want that ratty look that that causes. It's really a bush hog stuck on or a flail mower on so, uh, sideways. Um, but we do need to get. Um, the brush back, it, our roads are being encroached on. But the idea was to get a good quality, heavy duty machine that'll be around for a while. So we don't have to revisit this uh, anytime soon. Okay, that's, we that's have a hand up in the middle here. I'd like to call a question. Okay, the question has been called. So that means we need to stop debate and see if two thirds of you are ready to Vote on the main question. All those in favor of ending debate on this article as amended, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? 
Okay, the article, we, we are moving to the article. Shall the voters authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed $25,000 for a term not to exceed four years for the, the one-time purchase of a used wood chipper? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and Article 8 passes. Article I just wanted to give Paul, it was 2018. The amount was 31,000, town appropriate 31,448. Total, total right, was 40 the article is, okay. We're I just wanted to follow up. up and give them the information, that's all. Yep. Article 9, shall the voters appropriate $27,000? $132 for the Kellogg Hubbard Library for its operating expenses. You want to move this article, Craig? Do we have a second? You want to speak to it? Every year. The Kellogg Hubbard Library does not look towards buying a wood chipper in the next year. Um, I am beginning my seventh year as a member of the board of the library. And every year I hear myself saying, things are just great at the library. And I'm not sure how to change that to make it even better. Um, our executive director, Tom McCone, retired at the end of June last year after five and a half years at the helm. And his attention to detail and his love of the library and of people really uh, helped turn things around 180 degrees from the previous administration, and I was lucky enough to start on the board at the same time he did. We have now moved to a two-person co-directorship of the library. Uh, Jesse Lynn, who's been there for 10 years, and Carolyn Brennan, who is a librarian, um, came from South Hero, loved Kellogg Hubbard so much that she and her family moved to Montpelier and, and bought a house there. And the two of them came up with a plan as we had engaged in the search for a new director uh, that they wanted to do it. So they have split the duties up between library stuff and then financial human resources stuff. And I just cannot say enough about these two women. It is, uh, it's remarkable. The staff is happier than ever. Um, staff positions changed. Everyone got a chance to say, actually, I'd like to do this instead of that. Um, they're open ears all the time, and it's, it's a joy to be on the board. Speaking of the board, we have five new members. We have a total of 15 members on the board now, which is the maximum allowed by our bylaws. We have a new member in Middlesex, in East Montpelier, and finally, just recently, from Berlin, and two new members from Montpelier. Uh, we have term limits. I am just starting my third and final three-year term, so, I'm happy to talk to anybody who thinks they might want to take over in a couple years. Um, we're not asking for an increase this year. We have asked Callis uh, and all the towns, the five surrounding communities, for the same amount. This will be the third year in a row. Uh, the report from the library, the written report is on page 91 in your town report if you want to read it. I do have some sheets here with uh, statistics and information, both about the library in general and then specific to Calis. Um, the website has been rebuilt and there's a lot of information. There. You can read the minutes of the last board meeting. You can look at bios of the board members. There, there, and there's an update about the capital campaign that we just finished at the end of the year this was a four-year effort by the board to raise, actually we raised over $600,000 from many contributors, 200 contributors, including businesses such as National Life and other insurance companies in town. We received about $150,000 in grant money for the replacement and renovation of the elevator was the biggest thing. And lots of other interior and exterior work, some of which has already been done. There's an Instagram page you can look at with photos of projects. That whole fundraising effort was to put into the building and its maintenance because every year we ask all the towns for money and Montpelier pays 
a hugely bigger amount every year, but that's all for operating expenses. And we never have had enough money to pay attention to the building's needs. So now we are set up, we have a reserve fund established and lots of work will be being done on the library over the next two years. So that's, that's all I have. I urge your support and as always you can ask questions, uh, send me an email at any time. I post weekly about events at the library. Um, happy to field any questions now. Thank you. Okay, we have a hand up right here. Hi, my name is Flora, I'm in the East Cowes. Um, I saw that there was a um, book exchange at the East Cowes General Store and there is no longer a general store. I wonder if you could address that. And then secondly, um, I was really disappointed in the last few years when the library's um, hours reduced and I was just wondering if there's any talk of it increasing again because I really miss those evening times, I miss those Saturday afternoon times. And it'd be great for the library to be open on Sunday, but you know. I can answer both of those things. The bookshelf that was in the East Cal store was moved to the main corner store. I know, it's not where you live. We, we would certainly get a shelf back in East Calus, and it's all our hope that that store will be reinvigorated once again. Sorry? Um, maybe the post office. We, we try to run some programs in the East Calus Rec Center, and, and we just didn't have enough attendance to justify it. But I'll check into that. Um, we have an outreach director, she's part-time, but there are lots of volunteers. There are 200 some volunteers and people love to bring books out. Um, we can arrange for delivery. There is a, a bookshelf also in Adamant at the co-op. Again, if you live in East Calus, it's harder. Um, as far as the shortened hours, it was financial, our operating costs. And with any organization, we're a, a 501c3 operation, so nonprofits, our expenses, especially healthcare, continue to go up and up and up. Sometimes healthcare costs go down depending on choices that the employees make. If a person who works in the library's spouse has health insurance, sometimes they opt for that plan because it's a better plan. We had to cut the hours because we had a budget shortfall and, and we just will not operate in the red, ever. So. Um, a lot of people have voiced a similar concern, and um, everybody would, I'd love to go to libraries on Sundays. I, I can't see that happening. There has been some talk of can we reestablish more evenings. Um, you know, our budget is being formed now. Our fiscal year is July 1 through June 30th. Um, our revenues have been good this year. Um, again, some things you're going to see some changes. There's going to be an automatic book checkout system that's coming out of the fundraising campaign. So we're not taking that away from, well, if you didn't buy that system, then maybe you could have longer hours. That's not how it works in this case. So uh, I'll pass that along. Thanks. Okay, other discussion of Article 9? Yes, there's a hand up over there. Well, I dare say this. My name is Rose Higgins. I live in Madeline. Um, it just seems that a town that is so far in debt really should think twice about how much money they're giving away. That's all I have to say. Okay, there's another hand up right there. Dan Ward from Robinson Hill Road and the uh, Homeless Speaking Support. Budget, not as something that we're giving away or as a charity, but I believe that access to information and support of the community is a fundamental obligation, not unlike our obligation to educate our children. Um, it would be unimaginable to not have the community resource. It can't be something that is done in a fragmented way because of the nature of bringing people together and having the infrastructure that the library represents. 20 years, my mother was a volunteer giving books to people who were stuck in their homes. Uh, I know what that meant to people because when she died, they, from all over in you know, all of the communities, sent me letters saying what it meant. Ms. Holbrook, the children's librarian, was a fundamentally important person to me growing up as she selected books for me and my own education. 
education. It feels to me that children especially, uh, children's books are expensive. And as children grow, they have a short half-life because they grow out of not having a community resource to share those books and make them accessible to people. Really an application of our responsibility. Okay, there's a hand up behind you, Reed. Thank you, Janet Poker, Robot, and Linda Callis. Um, I just wanted to also say about libraries and about the Kellogg Cover in particular, they are one of our free democratic spaces in society and in our community. And I just wanted to also point out the things that they do in terms of. Um, offering after school a uh, place for people to go, uh, people who don't have a place to go, who maybe need to go in and look for a job, you can have a computer there, um, there could be a homeless person getting warm, there could be um, teens who, instead of doing drugs, are going to be reading. I mean, there's just so much I feel like the library does aside from information and from the books and um, all the other wonderful aspects uh, that, that we have. So I just wanted to sort of um, just say how important that is. But again, it's a free space. You don't have to buy anything when you go into a library in York. And that's pretty rare in our increasingly consumerist society. Uh, and it's, it's a democratic place. That too seems to be disappearing. So I'm just wanting to put that in. OK, we have a hand up right there. Hi, my name is Kat Johnson. I'll just add, um, I don't know how many of you have taken advantage of the online app that the library makes available, but I'm listening to books all the time, and if any of you have Audible um, memberships, you're paying to listen to books, and I just want you all to be aware that you can do it through the library and not pay anything, and I think it's a, it's a pretty amazing um, benefit that's available to all of us, too. So I just wanted to also make you aware of that. Okay, so the question is, shall the voters appropriate? Oh, we have another hand. Once again, I just want to point out, we just voted to borrow $25,000. Now we're giving away $27,000. Okay. Millie, Millie's had her hand up for I've got a hand that I haven't called on there, and I don't think he's spoken yet today, so I'm going to go that place first. Thank you. I'm Michael Fullerton from North Dallas. We debate this issue every year. There are some here, me, me included, who think we should give the library money. There are others who think we should not. And I don't think in the last year anybody on either side has changed his or her mind. So I would like to call a question. <laughs> okay, the question has been called. That's not debatable. I'm sorry. You'll, if to, if two-thirds don't want to end debate, you'll get another shot at it. All those in favor of ending debate, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. The ayes have it, and we are ending debate. Article 9, shall the voters appropriate $27,132 for the Kellogg Hubbard Library for its operating expenses? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and Article 9 passes. We're going to stop the articles for a moment and welcome our representative, our terrific representative, Janet Hansen. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, so it's always so wonderful to be here. I start my day in Marshfield at 9 o'clock. And then I do the Plainfield meeting at 10, and then I get to come to my own hometown, which is just, it's just a wonderful feeling. Um, usually, uh, oh, before I start, I want to introduce uh, a guest, uh, Senator Tim Ash, who is President Pro Tem. <laughs> this weekend if there were some traditional town meetings around my area that I, I thought that would be good for him to attend. And I couldn't think of three better places than Marshfield, Plainfield, and Callis. So he's been with me all morning, and um, he's just heard a really good debate. Um, generally, what I do when I'm here is I give you, you know, some news about what's going on in Montpelier, and I'm happy to do that. But I have something 
uh, another message from Montpelier that I think is uh, probably even more special. And I'm going to read it, because uh, this is a resolution that we passed on uh, Friday. Um, so it's a House concurrent resolution honoring John McCullough and Donna Fitch for their leadership in the, re in the renovation of the Callis Town Hall. And no, John, you can't leave. <laughs> so, um, and it's offered by me. Uh, whereas John McCullough and Donna Fitch jointly facilitated the completion of phase of the Callis Town Hall renovation project, and whereas Donna Fitch has served previously on the select board and is town clerk and treasurer, and her husband John McCullough is a local architect, and whereas John McCullough assumed a hands on approach as the new general contractor, and the couple coordinated the work of many dedicated volunteers, and whereas the phase two renovations included constructing a new foundation and septic system and installing insulation upgrades and radiant floor heating. And I'll say as an aside, that makes it sound really dull. It is a stunning building. Um, and whereas in recognition of a special effort, John McCulloch is the first recipient of the new, newly minted John McCulloch Cit Cala Citizen of the Year Award. <laughs> resolution to John McCulloch and to Donna Fitch, which means I have two of them, but it does occur to me that you two could share. <laughs> so there they are. Maybe you could put one up at the town hall. I don't want to take away from Jeremy's time, but um, we could not have done this without the trust and support of the select board. Um, the donors, there's a list back there of our donors and our volunteers. Um, the Town Hall Renovation Committee, which met for at least a year, every single Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock. And we met at 8 o'clock because David Sheets had to get to Montpelier by 9. Um, there's going to be a grand opening in May, and so I hope you all come. And I just want to tell you a little bit about my love story with my husband. <laughs> some, of <you> know that <laughs> some of you know that 43 years ago, I met John McCall at the Fall Foliage Festival. He was getting his 1953 Ford pickup truck ready to drive back to California, and his Vermont license plate said, Adios, Vermont. And he never left. <laughs> so I would like to thank my husband for putting his heart and soul into Callis and feel the same way about the town as I do. Well, I can't possibly top that story. I'm trying to think of something I could tell you about what's going on in Montpelier that would be at least as wonderful as what you just said now. Um, I don't know how much more time I've got. I will touch very quickly on three or four issues. Um, one, minimum wage. For those who've been following the issue, we actually overrode the governor's veto a little over a week ago. <laughs> Uh, we actually had no votes to spare, um, which would suggest to me that we hit the right um, amount. It wasn't quite as high as I hoped it would be, but um, but will actually make a real difference for 40,000 Vermonters. Um, another bill that we uh, acted on last week, or a little over a week ago, was the Global Warming Solutions Act, um, which actually turns what have been sort of aspirational goals into legally enforceable goals um, in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. That will really make a difference. Pass the House, it's going to go to the Senate. Um, they're working on the TCI, which is another thing that I think is a really 
would be a good thing to pass, so we'll try to uh, come to an agreement uh, before the end of the session on both those issues. Um, and the other one I want to mention, because I know uh, people in this district certainly contacted me about it, was the Act 250 bill. Um, that bill had a lot of really good changes, sort of updating Act 250 in terms of climate change and um, the, the, our focus on downtowns. Um, but it also had a change in terms of the structure of Act 250 of making this professional full-time board that would have been good for lawyers but not good for regular people. Um, and it also would have um, basic, basically eliminated the district commissions. When that came to my committee, we decided not to fund it, which basically killed it and killed the board. The new board. So, I think the rest of the bill, as it, as it passed the House, is worth having. Um, and there are lots of good things in it. And I've got at least one member of the Senate here. I hope message to Tim. Hope you guys work on it. Um, so there are lots of other things that we've been working on, but those are three highlights. And um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but happy to try to answer them if there are. I'll take a couple. You can pick. Oh, I get to pick. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> You know, it's this, I guess it's Act 46 about the because you know, it, it's, it seems like there's, you know, status quo thinking about this and not very much creativity. And I have yet to hear anyone say it's going to improve our education or lower costs. And what I see is that it's institutionalizing and growing an education bureaucracy that is not in the best interest of our children. In working with them for over 30 years, you know, they're in a paradigm that no longer exists. That, you know, we, I saw back in the 90s where we needed welders, electricians. We're importing people. We don't have, you know, this idea that everyone needs a college education. That, that went out of date a long time ago. Uh, but the bureaucracy, the education bureaucracy, is hanging in there. And now it's just consolidating it more and more. To, and, and saying, oh, by the way, you're going to pay for it with you know, taxation without representation. You know, we fought a revolution on that. But, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, it's a moral issue. It's not even ethics. It's what's happening is immoral because it is directly impacting our ability as a, as a state and as a country to survive because we are not, you know, what we're doing in the education system as it is, is out of date. So, you know, I would encourage, and I'm going to ask, what is the Senate and the House doing about this? And it seems like they're just sitting on their hands and saying, well, you know, it'll pass. So there are a number of, que number of questions in your question. Um, the, the, the nuts and bolts of Act 46, I certainly have made every effort to slow it down, to change it, and so on. I've put in legislation. I have legislation that can again this year. Um, and the truth is that I've just not been able to get much of a hearing um, in the relevant committees. Uh, the uh, other issues, um, doesn't mean I won't continue to talk with people. I will. Um, it's frustrating for me as well. Um, the other issues that you're talking about in terms of, you know, uh, sort of what I think of generally as workforce and, you know, thinking about the kinds of jobs that, uh, that we really need to train kids for now. Um, and, you know, maybe rethinking this idea that everybody has to go to college. I've got an 18 year old grandson and having that conversation with him as well. Um, I think is work that is happening uh, now, whether it's happening to some extent in the Commerce Committee, to some extent in the Education Committee. Uh, there's also an effort um, that uh, I know Mac and Cindy have been heavily involved in uh, to focus on literacy, because literacy is, you know, that's basically, that's, that's where, um, that's what we need to make sure everybody has, is able 
to, it has access to it, which I'm not using the right words, but when you look at inequities, um, particularly between uh, urban and rural, and you look at inequities um, in terms of poverty, literacy is where you see it. Um, and so that's, that's work that the Education Committee has done a lot of work on. That bill has actually ended up in my committee now. Um, and so I think there are things, positive things that are happening. At 50, at 46 continues to be a frustration, I'll be honest. Um, no, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. Microphone is coming. Thank you. Uh, Peter Junkie, East Dallas. Um, I just want to add a quick note to the, I agree 100% about the literacy thing, but I also want to really emphasize financial literacy as well. I think every, that's really followed down and, and, and shows in terms of a, a lot of things. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, and we'll have one more question in front and then we'll move on. I'm Cindy Gardner Morris. I, it's come to my attention that in Cabot, and in Peacham, um, they aren't being treated the way Callis is in, under Act 46. And I just wondered if they were comment about that. I, I don't believe they've been unified. I know that that's true with Peacham, and there were some special findings. I haven't looked at what they are. I don't know about Cabot. Cap well, I guess Cabot had a vote, and they ended up in a different supervisory union, but not consolidated. There was a interesting sort of history with Twinfield and Cabot and Danville. Um, I, I, I could probably find more information about it, but um, yeah. A quick follow-up. More than what happened with those towns, I'd like to know how come Callis can't work something like that out. If only we knew somebody on the committee that had some power. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there are different circumstances. I can't, I can't give you a single answer at the moment, but um, so it's a good question for an offline conversation. Yeah. Okay, we'll give Doug the final question, then we'll try to get back to our warning. Hi, right, Doug Lilly, better known as Lilly Hill Farm. I'm going to talk to you about the lot of things here. I'm going to get a little too late about the, Doug. About the library in Montpelier. I got to hear a little bit too, too late to talk about the the chipper, I heard, and I come through the door. You know, we talked about this for years. You now I want to talk to you about, uh, I had a guy bring me a load of hay two years ago. He went over the bank, right up here the top of the hill. Ashen Towing, the towing company, he rolled it over. They charged him $7,500 to pull him back on the road. I had a called all over the United States, and I looked it up, and there's a law out there where the act of toy company does not have a right to keep, in other, some countries can't charge you that. Once they hook onto your rig, if you're poor or you don't have an insurance on your car, they own that until you pay for it. He's a poor farmer, and he, I couldn't get, I could not find an attorney to represent him, okay? I paid all his court costs. He wouldn't go to court, but I paid his court costs. Are you watching me or no? Yeah. Okay, so now, so now, uh, I, want, I want to talk to you. Last year, on a, uh, and I called your house. Yes, I did. And you know, technology today is so much smarter than you or me, okay? Especially me. So I called you, and your phone was busy all day long. So I call, and you say, here, and I don't think you said this year, but you said, you want to talk to me, call me. We'll talk to you. Well, I tried to call you, and I want to have you, I want to make a bill, a new bill, for this action towing, and this towing, your car, my car, you know, how they can charge the most. Check. Most I've ever heard anybody get is $80,000, $90,000 to pull their tractor trailer back on the road. Okay? So I wanted to write a bill for that, and I wanted to talk to you about it. And I tried to call you, and you wouldn't answer your phone. So I got a hold of it. It was Labor Day, by the way. I know exactly what it was Labor Day. So I called your house. Phone was busy all day long. So I went to the operator. Gus, what do you think of it? I'm listening. This is okay. it's quite a story. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real story. Why don't you look at the end of it, then you'll hear it. So now, 
she, I called the operator. I says, her phone out of order. No. Is it, she says, is she talking on it? No. She says, she's got it off the hook. I don't have a phone. <laughs> well, you don't, well, I'll tell me, that was two years ago. I, I haven't had a landline in well, certainly two years. You, uh, how did anybody get a hold of you then? I have a cell phone and it's listed and it's online. I'm happy to share it with you. I will give it to you right after well, we Well, that finish. is what the operator yeah. told me, okay? So now, back to taxes, back to taxes. Yes, I know I've got here late and probably other people over here have more time than I have already, okay? So I wanna tell you, you guys, I wanna tell you this right now. I'm telling you, Lily Hill Farm is done. We're putting houses here and I told my neighbor over there, she said, you're trying to scare me. Well, I'm not scaring you. 35 years ago, I had that farm perked by you Frey and Henry. That farm is perked. And if you're walking down Tucker Road and you've almost come to Lake Ridge Road, you will see those white sticks in the ground. You will see them. Have you ever seen them? That's what that's for. That costs $35,000 to do that. I knew this day was coming. You guys, this schools, the library, you guys have put me out of business. You goddamn done it to me. You've done it to me. Point of order. You have done it. No, he's speaking out of order. No, and I you let not. him talk anytime you want what to talk. What about civility? You get out of here. I want some civility done. You get out of here. Put him down. Tell him, Gus, tell him he's talking out of order. Mr. He's out of here. He always jumps out of order. No matter what you talk about. Yeah. So, you raised my taxes $1,700 this year. My taxes went up, and I'm almost $20,000. I struggled to pay my taxes. Last year I didn't pay my taxes. I had to pay a late fee, uh, I had to pay a late fee, and a penalties, and I pay all over $20,000. This year I'm late again. I'll pay another $20,000. And you know what? They're gonna try to sell me out. They're gonna have a sure sale on me. I've been here for almost fucking 80 years, and they're going to have a sheriff's sale. Sorry, but I can't put up with this, Mr. Moderator. Well, go home. Go home. Go back to sleep. Go back to up there. That, that's enough. It's your okay, job that, to keep that is, in order. He, he had a statement he wanted to make, I, 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 and I, he's I'm made it. to the expletives. Just he's out of order. I think, he's focused, I he's think, his hand, and you didn't acknowledge him. He's out of order, he does that every time. He asked for point of order. You've had your statement. Janet, thank you very much for representing us in the State House. Okay, it's about 11.35. We're on Article 10. I don't know if we'll pick the pace up or not. I know once we break for lunch, we lose a lot of folks. Article 10 says, shall the Voters appropriate the indicated sums as requested by the following organizations in Callis and the Central Vermont area. There are 24 organizations listed, totaling $26,013. We've had a committee review this article. Does somebody want to, from the committee want to move it? It's been moved and seconded. Is there some discussion from the committee? Mac is going to have a word about it. I believe there's three new entities on this list. Yeah, uh, we reviewed the list, and uh, I think we all agreed on all of the things on the list. Um, the one, one thing we did have a discussion about is uh, a couple of the big ticket items are the senior centers. Uh, Multiplayers is going up by $600, and uh, uh, they serve about 55 people in town. Uh, and we also have Twin Field, and uh, a lot more local cost, and they serve, uh, you know, Part time is about 58 people. Um, so the committee you know, uh, is recommending you go ahead and vote for it. If you want to cut something, I think that the uh, committee was kind of wavering about the extra money for uh, Montpelier Senior Center. Uh, they are going up a lot this year, and uh, they're not a lot more users. So uh, if somebody can be critical about a, a price, that would be the one thing. Okay, the article has been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the... Oh, there's a hand up there. Yes. The microphone is on its own. Am I allowed to make an argument? 
Um, I'm not sure there's anything to argue about this afternoon because nobody's moved to amend the article, but you're from the Senior Center, and if, any, and if anybody has questions, they could ask them of you when we break or right now if there's a question. There are no questions. It seems we're ready for the article, which is to appropriate a total of $26,013 to 24 organizations. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 10 is passed. Article 11 asks, shall the voters authorize payment of property taxes in two equal installments with the due date of the first installment on or before 4 p.m. on a date that falls not less than 30 days after the tax bills are mailed, but not earlier than Monday, August 3rd, 2020, and the due date of the second installment shall be on or before 4 p.m. on Monday, November 16th, 2020. Would someone like to move this article? It's been moved. Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, uh, yep. Mac. I bring this up every year. It just seems like we have a big delinquent tax thing, and we have this one, you know, these two big bills come due in the fall. And then, you know, it seems like we should have these consumer systems, the financial systems, that we could, you know, do it over four payments spread out over the year. I mean, other towns do this, and I think it would be, you know, easier on people if this was spread out over, you know, a thing. And I would urge the select board and the school boards and the treasurers to think about doing it in a different way. Okay. Any further discussion? Yes, Michael. Michael Fullerton. Um, that's a good idea, but is there anything to prevent people from budgeting it on their own and making multiple smaller payments? No. You can, you can pay your taxes ahead of time if you want. <laughs> Sandra, do you have any thoughts? Nobody can hear you, so wait for the Sorry. microphone. You are free to make tax payments at any time after the bills are issued. And you, many people prepay their taxes. In fact, I have several amounts prepaid for FY21's tax bills. So that is an option. OK, are you ready for the question? And it seems we are. The question is, shall the voters authorize payment of property taxes in two equal installments with the due date of the first installment on or before 4 p.m. on a date that falls not less than 30 days after the tax bills are mailed, but not earlier than Monday, August 3, 2020, and the due date of the second installment shall be on or before 4 p.m. on Monday, November 16, 2020. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? We passed Article 11. Article 12, shall each property tax installment payment be made via one of the following options? By delivery to the treasurer by 4 p.m. on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 11. By U.S. Postal Service with postmark on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 11. Or three, by credit card payment via www.callisvermont.gov by 4 p.m. on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 11. Would someone like to move this article? It's been moved. Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yes. Wait for the mic, please. Cindy Gardner Morris, I wondered how many people uh, put their taxes on their credit cards. Is that an option that people take a lot of advantage of? Yes. <laughs> Further discussion? If not, it seems we're ready for the article. All those in favor of Article 12, which offers three ways to pay your taxes, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Article 12 passes. Article 13, shall interest in the amount of half percent per month or any part of a month be charged on unpaid taxes? Would someone like to move this? It's been moved. Do we have a second? Seconded. Discussion? 
Okay, so we are ready for the question, it seems, and the question is whether that we will have interest paid in, a, in the amount of half percent a month or any part of a month on unpaid taxes. Is that, do I have the motion correct? Yep. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? And Article 13 passes. Article 14, shall the town allow an interest-free interest -free grace period of seven calendar days following each due date as set forth in Article 11 during which no interest shall be charged? Somebody want to move that article? So moved. It's been moved. Do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Yes. This question, um, didn't that used to be 30 days a month? It used to be, I think it used to be 14 or 15. Yes, we have a hand up on the far side. Yep, the microphone's coming. Peter Perkins, Maple Corner. Uh, why only seven days? We changed it because it created a lot of, I and mean, Sandra can probably explain it better on, because she's the collector of the taxes, but every time you do those days, then it, if it falls on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, and then it was sometimes the grace period would be so, it was almost into the time when the second installment was due, so there were a lot of different variables. Sandra, would you like to help me and elaborate on that? Well, over time, it has become, we almost have four due dates. We have the due dates, and then folks are starting to think of the grace period as the due date, and then, of course, we have the second payment and the grace period. So I think, actually, we want to, to make that grace period shorter and closer to the due date, mostly because we accept postmarks and that gives the opportunity for those postmarked um, tax payments to come in on time without creating essentially two, four sets of due dates all within a 14-day period of the actual due date. Thank you. Any further discussion of this article? Okay, so to repeat it, you're at, the question in front of you is to allow an interest-free grace period of seven calendar days following each due date as set forth in Article 11 during which no interest shall be charged. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and Article 14 passes. Article 15, shall a delinquent tax penalty be set at 4.5% of the total amount of the 2020 delinquent tax? Would somebody like to move this article? It's been moved. Do we have a second? It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Yes, Mac, we'll get the microphone to you. Oh, okay, we'll start in the back and come back to Can you refresh my memory on what it is now? There's one of you. What's the current penalty? I think it's the same. No change is the answer. And we'll go to Mac next. When does the penalty apply? Is it after the grace period or it's after the grace period? Are you ready for the oh, question? Sandra, I guess Sandra wants to. Uh, yes, go ahead, Sandra. Way. Just to be clear, the penalty is not applied until after the grace period of the second payment. There is no penalty for late payment of the first payment, just interest at one half of one percent. It's only after the second payment is due, the grace period after that second payment, that a penalty will be applied. So you. So, for example, you could be late on your first payment, and you would have a half a percent interest. But your second payment, um, but no penalty 
and you could pay your second payment on time. So you would have paid, in that example, one half of 1% on that first payment that ran late, but no penalty. Are you ready for the question? Yes. Uh, two questions. Number one, the uh, penalty. Who gets the penalty? Does it go to the tax collector as a fee, or does it just go to the town? Goes to, goes to the town. Okay. I'd like to make an amendment then that we reduce the 4.5 to 3 percent for the penalty. That's about as much as you can get in a CD if you're really lucky, and uh, 4.5 sounds a little excessive. So that's what I'd like to make that amendment. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to amend this article to set the penalty at 3%. We're up for discussion of the amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of amending the article by changing the penalty from 45 to 3%, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed? No. 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 The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and the article is amended. Are you ready for the main question as amended? If so, shall a delinquent tax penalty be set at 3% of the total amount of the 2020 delinquent tax? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And Article 15 is passed. Article 16 asks, shall the town allow a penalty-free grace period of seven calendar days after Monday, November 16, 2020, during which no delinquent tax penalty shall be charged? It's been moved. Do we have a second? It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of Article 16, shall the town allow a penalty-free grace period of seven calendar days after Monday, November 16, 2020, during which no delinquent tax penalty shall be charged, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? You've passed Article 16. Article 17 reads, shall the voters authorize a a reserve fund under 24 VSA subsection 2804, known as the Town Conservation Fund, to be used to acquire real property or other rights or interest in real property and undertake other activities consistent with the purposes of 10 VSA Chapter 155 and 24 VSA Chapter 118, as well as preserve historic resources and provide education and public outreach to promote natural resources conservation. Detailed guidelines for use of the conservation fund money shall be proposed by the Conservation Commission and adopted by the select board after public hearings. Would somebody like to move this article? It's been moved. Do we have a second? It's been moved and seconded. Does someone from the Conservation Commission want to speak to this one? Okay, we'll get you with microphone. Agricultural forest and other undeveloped land 
and to encourage the use of conservation and preservation tools to support farm forestry related enterprises. And that's what we've been doing with this money. The concern is, is that the original authorization only authorized the purchase. We, for instance, used Conservation Commission money. When I say we, it's the, the Conservation Commission uh, recommends to the select board, and the select board then decides whether to use the money because it's their fund. Um, but for instance, the Armstrong property at, down on the Beacon, that was purchased by a farmer. That was purchased by a farmer, and the conservation fund was used to help the farmer purchase it. You remember we had an inventory, a town-wide inventory of natural resources done. It was conservation fund money that was used. What we're asking now is for the townspeople, for you to clearly authorize this kind of activity. It's all for the purpose of conserving Vermont's natural resources, but it goes beyond just purchasing land outright. And that's what this is what this article is asking you. Okay, Larry, would you like a microphone? Yes, Larry Bushoff from Cal, also on the Conservation Commission. I'd just like to make a sort of a, a, a lay addendum to, to what uh, Stephanie just said. If I'm incorrect about my generalization, jump in and tell me. My understanding, though, is that when the town originally created the fund that is the conservation fund, um, it was it was done in the way that it's often done by towns, sort of people making suggestions and a vote. Uh, there is a the statute, which is I believe cited here in the state, which authorizes the creation of conservation funds like ours. Um, the, the, looking at the history of the use of the fund, it's always been consistent with what the state statute allows. The concern was, because of the sort of lay person's way that this was originally voted on, there was a concern that it, that it might be perceived as not being consistent with that, um, even though it's entirely consistent with what the state statute authorizes, and what I believe was actually referenced at the time the Conservation Fund was originally established. So this, in a very real sense, is just a kind of a technicality that says, yes, we want to keep doing what we're doing, and it's consistent with the state statute that authorizes conservation costs. Is that essentially right? Thank you. Yeah. So you're telling us you're not changing anything. You're just making sure we're consistent with state law. Exactly. And we're not, you know, it's not any more money or any less money. It's nothing is changing except that we're trying to broaden the purposes consistent with state law. Yes, we have a hand up in front, and the microphone's on its way. In Article 17, um, there's a reference to historic resources, but that is not in the law, and I'm wondering if the Conservation Commission could address what they interpret as historic resources. Stephanie, while you're looking, I would guess that at the very, at a very minimum, state law would refer to archaeological resources, which would might be historic in nature. But I don't know if it's broad enough. In Title Ten, Part Five, Chapter One Fifty Five, this talks about um, historic settlement pa patterns. It talks about natural resources, but it does not mention historic resources. It does talk about the historic settlement pattern, and I would imagine that the historic resources are part of the historic settlement pattern, a compact village and urban centers. Um, Publish, advertise, and distribute relevant books, maps, and other documents. 
and encourage through educational activities the public understanding of local natural resources and conservation needs. I would say that we would interpret historic resources as being natural resources. Now, people can disagree with that. You can do what you want with it, but we feel that historic resources are part of the town's natural resources. I guess I'm wondering if there is, you know, a move to say purchase a building that the town holds. Well, I can give you an example. Uh, Memorial Hall uh, asked the town for money, and um, the town agreed to uh, give Memorial Hall money, and it's partly, you know, we could say, well, that money is only for protecting the shoreline, but there is an historic house there, and we would hope that we would be able to support that with, with the conservation fund money. Okay. And in fact, the select board did vote to do that. Paul? Paul had it again. So the way this is worded, it, it's, you're saying, as, in other words, you recite this statute, and, uh, and then you say, oh, by the way, we also want to preserve historic resources, blah, 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 blah. So, I guess the way I'm reading this is it may not be authorized under the statute, but you're off asking for the authority anyway. You would say that if it's not authorized by statute, we want to authorize it. Yeah, that's what the other thing is. I mean, that's what, that's how I'm reading this. Yeah. And, and I think that's fine as long as we don't run into the same oops, we didn't do it quite right a few years from now. Yeah, well, it, we tried to be as, sort of as broad as we could this time. Okay, further discussion on this article. Yes. Uh, my name is Walter Obosinski. Just a question about process. It sounded like this was authorized or something similar in 1985. Uh, sometime, sometime in the past, do we need to amend that authorization or rescind that authorization before voting on this article? It's just a question of process. I have no idea, but. It just seems like if something was voted and authorized similar to this, we may have to do something with that before moving forward with this one. That's a reasonable question. Maybe the slip work can answer it. Well, I think you ran, you ran this whole process and made this change by the town's attorney. He never suggested anything like that, but I would think that this doing this replaces what was done previously. Yeah, we should have said that, because that's a good question. Um, I think the select board could probably take care of that. This does replace the previous authorization. We could amend this motion to say that. Put it in the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we could put it in the minutes and we could amend this motion to say that. If you want to, if you're suggesting that, are you making an amendment to this motion, to this article? I think he's just asking Only the question. Only that was just a question. Yeah, okay. it wouldn't hurt to do it so that it's crystal clear. Okay. You know, I see a bunch of lawyers, and some of them are waving their heads like this, and some are waving their heads like that. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm just going to suggest that you guys take it up with the town attorney, and if you need to do something more, you can bring it back next year. <laughs> okay. Yes? Wait for the microphone. I have a suggestion that you actually uh, define more clearly what the historic resources are so that people don't have to ask questions about it. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to assume that since there have to be detailed guidelines that will be subject to public hearings, that that would be a great time to ask the question you're raising or say you, you, you're not being specific enough. But I think that's in the as I'm reading the article, I think that's there, that we probably wouldn't get a definition today. Does that make sense to you? Oh, OK. You have a proposal instead? <laughs> You suggested running it by the town attorney or an attorney. Maybe that might be a good idea before it's 
So, so for clarification purposes, this was drafted by our town attorney in concert with the select board and the conservation commission. So this works. This replaces the existing language. It, it's technically an expansion over the previous authorization. It's not in conflict with the previous authorization, but an expansion of that. An and um, there are fund guidelines that are in existence now. And as Gus said, we, the select board notices all our meetings, and we can let you know, Rose, you can attend. It'd be great if you would, it'd be awesome. Um, and we'll have a lot of conversation about that language, sometimes too much, um, but you have, it would be great if you participated. We'd love, love that. Okay, we have a hand up here on the left. Excuse me. The question has been called, so that's not debatable. All those in favor of ending debate, please say aye. Aye. Those in favor of continuing debate, say nay. Okay, we're done debating this. Article 17, shall the voters authorize a reserve fund under 24 BSA subsection 2804 known as the conservation fund to be used to acquire real property or other rights or interests in real property and undertake other activities consistent with the purposes of 10 BSA chapter 155 and 24 BSA chapter 118 as well as preserve historic resources and provide education and public outreach to promote natural resource conservation Detailed guidelines for use of the conservation fund money shall be proposed by the Conservation Commission and adopted by the select board after public hearings. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it, and Article 17 passes. Article 18 is to transact any other non-binding business that may legally come before the meeting. Does anybody have some business? Yes, right in front, Wilson. Wilson Hughes from North East Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to remind everybody that April 1st is coming up. It's time to license your dogs again. License your dogs. Thank you. Okay, Fletcher. It's kind of the mic is on its way. Hi, Fletcher Dean. I'm just wondering if the town has any uh, gotten into any discussion about the coronavirus and if it should come to the fact that uh, schools may have to close, which we're starting to hear rumors of around the country, if not the world. Uh, just so, we, what would be the uh, communication to the townspeople and uh, if the schools should close? Do we have contingency plans? We have a plan, another use plan for the wood chipper for the coronavirus. <laughs> so I thought this question could come up at town meeting, and I hadn't seen anything from the Department of Health or Vermont Emergency Management or anything. Um, so I contacted the health department, and they sent back a rather long statement. I won't read it here, but I will post something on Front Porch Forum um, with a link to what the health department has said. And the governor also has released a press release just yesterday. So they're, we're working on plans. The state's been in contact with Vermont Emergency Management. They've created a task, task force. And they're supposed to contact towns and tell us what we might do in the event of the corona. I know there's been some concerns about food supplies and fuel and all those kinds of things that people think about when there's something like this going on. So we'll keep you updated. I'll make posts on Front Porch Forum. I'll give you a link to the press release that was just done that goes into a lot more detail than I can give you right now. Is that okay? Chris Noel? Got, yeah, I want to talk about the world. You need I the microphone or no one will hear you. Oh, I, I understand the a letter has gone out from our superintendents at Washington Central Unified District uh, about the coronavirus and how they're going to uh, deal with it. So all parents of students would have received this and maybe we can get that put on the front porch well. If you don't have a student, then... Excuse me? It would be good if that could be shared as a public document. If okay. you could share it, maybe do a 
I can a link or something I'll, yeah, on front porch form because I'd like to see what that says. Yeah. And I don't have kids in the yeah, school right now. We'll go. I want it again, if not for that. I'm Chris Noel from um, Apple Hill Road. And back right before Christmas, we all suffered a collective loss in this closure of the East Callis General Store. And I'm representing um, a group that's doing a lot and has been doing a great deal of work in trying to resuscitate that, to raise funds, to rehabilitate the building, and open the store back up. Um, I, uh, this picture here is taken in around 1860 which is the very near the beginning of photography itself. Um, and a century later, I moved here as, as a 12-year-old. Does anybody remember Willie Sayers? Yeah. You would put your, all your stuff down, and he said, that will do it. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll do it. And um, this store has been a central part of my life, and I know many of your lives, um, ever since then, for the 50, half century, you know, after that. And, so um, it's important that we come together um, to try to not only um, reopen the store in a newer, more sustainable fashion, but also to think about revitalizing the center of Cal East Calais itself. Um, we have a Facebook page called East Calais Revitalization Project. So it's a public group. Please join up if you are interested in in discussing this, and there's a long-term fundraising effort going, but we need to raise um, the money by May 1st in order to, to get this done in this current effort. Um, we have a fantastic brochure back at the table in the corner, the back corner there. Um, what am I not getting? Um, I don't know. What are you What? On the Facebook page, we have wonderful photographs. You're going to create a website, too. If we still need it after the Facebook. Um, I was going to ask you if we still need that, but I will if we need it. Some of us don't use Facebook. That's right. Some of you don't use Facebook, and I understand that. And um, so I can create a, a website, too. Anyway, we have um, other photos back there. And any questions? And also back there, we're looking for your input on what your vision would be in the building. So just stop by and jot a quick note down and we'll gather up all the suggestions. Suggestion basket, yep. like um, having a cafe type of format uh, in, in something similar to what they have in Maple Corner. Um, lots of other ideas have been floated. We just want to try to breathe life back into the middle of East Callis because with the loss of the store, it's like a big tooth has been extracted and we need to do some dental work. Yeah. <laughs> I drove by the other day and I saw that there is a realtor sign out front and I thought, what does that mean? We have, we have an option to purchase the building. That's why we're doing fundraising and we need to generate those funds by May 1st. So the sign is still there because it's technically still on the market, but the first option goes to the East Cal's Community Trust. Thank you. Other business anybody wants to conduct today? Yeah, we do. Once We've got a few people ahead of you, but we'll get to um, and It's sort of a resolution, I, but I really don't know how to get it all started. But I really want to have Callis build a school support committee. And my thought is if some select board members and some of the Washington Central just directors and the principal of the school could get together and figure out how we want to populate that committee, how what how big we want it to be, and, and get it started. And the purpose is to bring to the main board what we feel are important issues for Callis Elementary School. Thank you. Okay, Mary. <coughs> get to the middle there. Yeah, it's, it's going the other way. Hi, I'm Mary Jameson, um, and I live in North Callis, and um, I feel like I fall somewhere in between the East Callis store effort and, God willing, the town hall effort. <laughs> I'm working with the Memorial Hall effort. Um, I'm one of eight board members on the North Callis Memorial Hall Association, and last year, 
we were here, um, or I was here, standing up to say thank you to the select board and the House Conservation Commission who've been incredibly supportive. Um, and with your support, we were able to generate more support because we could say that we had town support and many conversations related to conservation. Um, so my update this year is good news and gratitude um, for anybody who is a fan of Memorial Hall. Um, we received a $100,000 Bruin Historic Revitalization Grant this year. We just received our 501c3, so we are um, tax exempt and we have a registered nonprofit. So uh, we're still raising funds, but we're almost there. And we have a team of an architect who lives in East Callis, north of the rec field, and is a sixth generation Vermonter, Ryan. Edwards, and we're working with Brian Park as our um, project manager, and we're working with Engineering Ventures as our engineers, and we're at this very moment drawing up the plans, um, working with our cost estimator to put the job out to bid and um, <laughs> not on wood, um, start construction to restore Memorial Hall and bring her back to her beauty this spring and summer. Um, so, I know there's a ton of people who've given volunteer hours um, and money in this room, and um, we're still looking for some contributions, so www.memorialhallcalis.org, and you can find out. And I wish luck to everybody else who's working on huge projects like this. Thank you. Yet another nonprofit has been formed uh, only within the uh, wake of the town hall project. Uh, we now have Friends of the Callis Town Hall as an official group. Um, they too have a board of trustees that is beginning to form, but you can get in on this free of charge um, by signing the cards at the table in the rear, putting them in the box, and you will be a charter member of the, Cal the Friends of the Callis Town Hall. We want everybody in Callis to be a member of this group that will start to operate the cultural aspect of the town hall in addition to its municipal uses in the newly renovated downstairs portion of the building. And we hope to take occupancy uh, in the coming month. Um, so it's a very exciting time at the town hall. We'll be having a big celebration very shortly as we open the doors to the community once again. And all of the money raised from your $5 lunches today goes to honor Donna and John and the town hall, okay? Do it for them. Do it for them. Okay. okay. Uh, Doug? You guys just give me $5. You guys just give me $5. So I can afford to have lunch here. I don't want that money now. <laughs> Anyway, I got a few things I want to say, and I'm going to get out of your hair. Well, I don't know where my buggy is up there, but it's there somewhere. Anyway, uh, I think town, hall, uh, town meeting is old school. I think there's 200 people here, and there's another 1,200 people in this town that are making the decisions because they're working people. The people that are making the decisions are here to make that decision. Spend our money, spend their money. Not, you know, they can afford to be here, so, but they're making, they're spending out, they're, they're out of 1,200 people with money. That's not right. That's not right. It really isn't. Okay, so I, uh, no, they don't come and vote, but they can, they can't take the time off. Anyway, I want to see the select board, I want to see it, the chair rotate. You've been here too long, it's old school, you need to rotate. I'm sorry, we just can't be there year after year after year. We need to clean the swamp. 
The old Trump deal. We need to clean the swamp. We really do, folks. I'm sorry. I believe in cleaning the swamp. Okay, I'm out of here, Gus. I'm out of your hand. Thank you. Uh, Rose. Hi. <clears throat> Rose Pelchuk. Um, I respectfully disagree with you, Mr. Lilly, that we're not swamp people. And I want to say that each... Each March, our first organizational select board meeting, which happens next Monday, the select board nominates a chair and a vice chair, and our town would be nothing without the absolute phenomenal work of Denise Wheeler, co-anchored by John Franklin. We, we just absolutely couldn't do it without her. Um, I had two things. Next Thursday, March 12th, from 6 to 7.30, is the annual rabies shot clinic at the East Montpelier Fire Department. Um, $20 a shot. And I just wanted to touch base with Michael Fullerton. When we talk about the library, each year, for those of you like myself who have been coming here year after year after year, and maybe we think we're not really changing anybody's mind, there's one person in our community who isn't here this year, elderly, whatever. I brought a card, if anyone wants to send well wishes, to Geraldine Gilman, um, a, a, a real wonderful lady who always spoke up about the library against it. Um, and I miss her here today. So if you feel like just sending a well wish to Geraldine, I have a card just to put your name. Any other business? Yeah, we've got a hand up up there. Uh, John Rosenblum from the suburbs of Maple Park. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Alfred and Toby and the road group for um, helping uh, solve a, a really big problem with Curtis Pond uh, getting runoff from Worcester Road. Uh, the hill above Worcester Road has been washing out for years and running straight into the pond. And they put in a solution, you can see it from the road, where there's a satellite pond, there's a culvert that crosses the road and runs out a lot of them run off into, uh, into a long, flat area. Uh, so and they took care of this problem you know, within a week after we met to talk about it. So I just, it's a huge uh, improvement to, uh, to, to Curtis Pond. It's not going to be the final solution, but it, it, solved, it really helps because Curtis Pond is silting in and and uh, the lily heads are growing because of that. So this really helps, and it was a great job, very quickly done, but very well done. Thank you. Anyone else? Matt. I, I just wanted to thank the Trails Committee. Uh, there are some great trails, uh, like great trails on, on the Maple Corner side of town, and up in the hills there just last weekend. We hiked over to Worcester. Uh, they're doing a phenomenal job with the trails on our side of town, and, and uh, I hope people in these cows can get some trails in the future, too. But I just want to thank uh, uh, Reed and the members of the Trails Committee for all the work they're doing. They're doing a great job. I'm joining you.